Beast Shaman here. You'll notice I've got a scrolling list above me of my patrons who support me on Patreon. Thank you very much. I really appreciate each and every one of you. Today, you guys, we're looking at something a little darker. I mean, this is just kind of, it's very, I took a brief look at this and it's very dark. It's one of Randy Stair's tapes that he called him, that he left behind. And this one's actually directed towards his parents, whom he, uh, he had a lot of anger towards, a lot of anger. And, uh, we're, we're going to check it out today. I'm not sure how much we're going to get through, but we're going to go ahead and give it a shot. Uh, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Randy Stair. You know, you see it done so often in movies. People documenting their will on tape and saying things like, if you're watching this, I'm dead. I'm sorry. You know? You do. It is common in movies. And honestly, I've envisioned this day coming for as long as 10 years. 10 years? And I never thought it would come, but here it is. So, I wanted to record this for you, Mom, Jeremy, Dad, and really. You see the way he says to... "Dad" right there. It, uh, I think his dad's the one he has the most anger towards, and you'll see that in a little bit. And that's why he kind of says it like that. The family that would want to watch it and to help maybe help you better understand why I did what I did and. It's really interesting how Randy left all of this behind and how he kind of romanticizes it. I've touched, I've touched on that before. He really romanticizes all of this. And uh, to him, it's, it's, I think it's a way that he can get attention. You know, he always wanted attention, but he never really got the attention that he wanted. And now with this, he knew he was going to get attention. So it's almost as if, you know, after, in the afterlife, he's getting what he wanted in this world. How you didn't see it coming and all that and... Really just to talk to you one last time, because obviously now I won't be able to. So, I'm recording this with my, my iPhone. I'm recording this with my iPhone. I tried my Canon camera, but the SD card was being a bitch. Kept stopping recording every fucking, like, two minutes, and I got fed up with it. So, unfortunately, it's going to be an iPhone quality video, so sorry about that. Still good quality. But, um... Anyways, I can guarantee you that none of you saw this coming. None of you would ever remotely expect me to do something like this. And I guarantee you can't believe that I could do something like this. You know. I'm sure they couldn't. I know you could be thinking, like, you could have gotten help. You could have seen a psychiatrist. You could have gotten help. But the truth is, that wouldn't be me. Me being on medication, sitting in therapy. No. That alters who you are. It's not me. Never the problem is, whenever you are uh, so disturbed that you want to go out and kill people and kill yourself, that, that there's an issue there. There's such an issue there. And I've said before... That if someone is determined to take to take their own life, and that's what they're going to do no matter what, then hey, so be it. You know, you can try as hard as you want to help them, but if that's what they're going to do no matter what, then so be it. But for the fact that they're going to go out and kill others as well because they're so disturbed, that's where the problem comes in. That's where you need the help, if not just for your own sake, for the sake of the world, for the sake of others, you needed help. Never would be. I couldn't do that. And also, I knew it wouldn't cure me. It wouldn't help me. So. He said 10 years he'd been thinking about it. One of the big things you'll notice is I was obviously a good liar in the last few years of my life. Because growing up, you know full well that I, I was a terrible liar. If I knew a secret and tried to lie about it or tried to, like, lie to get myself out of a situation, you pretty much always knew that I was lying. You know, it showed. But... I'd say as far back as 2013, I got better at it because I knew that my life was on the line. You know, I didn't want to fuck up. I didn't want to get sent to therapy or a mental ward or anything like that. I that wouldn't have been fucking up. That would have been what you needed. I made it count, you know. If people felt concerned about me, I just said, you know, I'm a little, you know, 
I'm down. I can get depressed at times, but you know, I'm okay. You don't need to worry about me or anything like that, you know. But I doubt any of you knew how depressed I was. And probably now if you just sit there and look back and think about it, you'll probably be like, I don't know how I didn't see it because now I do. You know, I don't know for certain, but um I guess I should tell you when this started because all throughout my life, I was never big on living. I hated life. I almost always did. I hated meeting people. You know that full well. I just hated going through everyday life. I always did. What, what would cause someone to hate life from a very young, early age? You know, and the thing about Randy's, from what he tells us, he didn't have a very rough life. You know, not, not in the sense of what we would consider to be difficult. He had a very easygoing life, very easygoing from his entire life. So why did he hate life? He says from an early age, he hated life. Why? There are people with so much more difficult lives that they live, yet they don't hate living. And I just always wanted to get away from it all. I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to go to work. It just, it wasn't me. It was never for me. But in this day and age, you know, you need a degree. You need all that to get a fucking career and all that shit. But I knew full well that in a few years I'd be dead. You, know? you don't need a degree. You don't need a degree. There are plenty of successful people who don't have degrees. There was no That's point. an outdated but ideology right there, brother. The depression started back up. Like, as I said, like, you know, I, I hated my life, my whole life, pretty much. I hated being alive. And, um,. Elementary school, middle school, things were okay. You know, I thought about death occasionally. I, like, I would picture, like, in my head, like, what is the afterlife like? Like, what do you do for eternity, you know? I think no about that, how too. How old I'll live to be or all this. And the one thing that always struck me was I could never see my future, ever. Like, you know, when you're growing up, you have, like, ambition and being like, oh, I can do this the rest of my life or I want to be this and all that, which I had. But... I was never able to see myself getting married. I was never able to see myself having kids. I was never able to see myself past my 20s, ever. And it's because it's not set in stone. You know, it's up to you. It's up to each and every one of us how our future is going to play out. And if you couldn't see it, it's because you lacked a vision. You had no vision. You need to set a vision, set your goals, and follow through with them. Randy. It, uh, it just was one of those things where it's like, wow, I might not live very long. And it's like, I knew I wasn't going to live very long. And this one other girl who died, Rachel Scott, if you've ever heard of her name. Dad wasn't she like bullied? She was from Columbine. She was one of the, oh, the no, Columbine, Columbine shooting victims. Okay. Which I'll talk about Columbine a little bit later on. They made a movie about her. It's like a very... Christian themed movie, I believe. That's what he's talking about. But they made a movie. I'm not ashamed. It was <laughs> a cheesy movie. It was all just hyping up fucking Christianity and all that garbage. But um I bought it and I watched it and I thought it was okay, minus the Jesus shit and all that, but um it was still cool to watch and um she had the similar experience of being like, I can never see my future and I feel like I'm gonna die young and that's just how it's meant to be and all that and that's how I felt like my whole life and I still got through you know middle school and elementary school and all that but once I got into high school it just became endurance that's what it felt like to me I, just, I haven't actually seen that movie but I heard it's not very good has anybody else seen that movie I did not want to get up and go to that school every day and I just I wasn't living I feel like I never like lived and I didn't want to either that was the other thing and it wasn't just because I was afraid to do certain things. It was just I didn't want to live. And high school, I was that typical jaded teenager, you know, just don't want to be here. Don't want to do anything. I'm bored with my life. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. You know, the typical teenage drama shit you deal with. And That's a big problem with a lot of young people nowadays, including myself when I was in high school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't have a direction set. You know, I feel like I somewhat lacked guidance as a teenager. 
and I didn't have directions set. I was a late bloomer. It took me a long time to actually become passionate about something. Well, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a rapper, and I sold mixtapes at school and shit. That didn't really work out. But, um, but no, we all need direction, you know? And I think that's something that we can develop in our 20s. If we don't develop it in te our teenage years, we still have our 20s to develop it, you know? And it's never too late. There are highly successful people who don't even realize what they want to do until they're in their 30s or 40s, sometimes even 50s. It's you're never too old to start building, you know, upon whatever it is that you're passionate about that you want to do. Age doesn't matter when it comes to accomplishing your goals and your dreams. Remember that. Press play. Growing up and all that, and I thought about suicide in high school. That's when it really started entering my mind, like, a lot. And I just, like, started to grow, like, attached to, like, darker stuff, which it really took off later down the road. But in, in like, early high school, it just wasn't really there too much. But the thing that really started to push it was, like, when I started doing bad on all my tests and got bad grades and had to get tutored and started to prepare for college and having no idea what I wanted to do and... I just, I wanted to go to Grandma and pop -Op's house and get one of their handguns and shoot myself. Or completely douse myself with gasoline and light a match and hopefully it would kill me, you know. Mm. And it was in 2010 when I really legit started to think about doing it. Because I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to get a job. I didn't want to live on anymore. I just didn't want to do it. That's a big problem. That's a big problem that a lot of people can relate to. Is the fact that this world, you know, it's just the world that they experience is just boring. It's not fun, you know, there's nothing they're passionate about. And that's something I can relate to, too. I felt in the past, like, shit's just boring, you know? Even nowadays, sometimes I feel like, man, shit's just fucking boring. What's the point of all this shit? It's all the fucking same, you know? But that's when you need to search deep within yourself and find something that you care about enough to, uh, you know help you go on to get excited about you need things in your life that you can be excited about and once you find that whatever it is that excites you hold on to it and don't let it go never let it go randy had found the egs the ghost squad his animations he made his youtube channel he had he should have held on to that he should have pursued it and he should have it's what made him happy it's what he loved he should have dedicated to it and stayed to it and he could have used that as a crutch to stay up on. You know what I mean? Uh, there's things like video games. Some people really love their video games so much, that's their crutch that keeps them up. It's what they get excited about. There's people that love things like anime, you know? These are things that some people look at and say, oh, I don't care about that. But for others, it's their life. It's their world. It's what hold them, holds them up. You know, for other people, it's fitness, working out. There are all sorts of things that you can do, that you can find. They can be your life force, your motivating force that can push you forward to succeed. And then you take those things, and then what you do is you try to find out how you can turn that into some sort of a career. Like you need to be passionate about it, you know? You need to find what you're passionate about and go with it, baby. I wish that Randy could have done that. And this is when the whole Ember thing started, which you may or may not know what I'm talking about yet. But if you watch my cartoons... I'm going to have to talk about a lot in this recording, by the way, because there's so much for me to cram into this thing that's, like, impossible. But I've told you about her before. Like, if you look on the poster behind me, those were inspired by Ember McLean, which is a ghost from a TV show called Danny Phantom, which started back in 2003, 2004. This is really interesting how he's actually explaining who Ember is and who the Ghost Squad is, he's explaining that in this video. That's to his parents. If he's explaining it to them, that means there was no communication between them about it. Or even if there was, it was probably, you know, very small. But for something that's so big in his life and so important in his life, the fact that he wasn't open with his parents about it and communicating with them back and forth, that shows there was a lack of communication there. You know, when something's that big and important in your life and you've got posters of it in your room, your parents should know about it, you know? And hopefully they'll be supportive of you and whatever it may be. But the fact that he has to explain it to them now in this video, that shows there was a lack of communication there. And that's not, that's not good. Or, you know, I was in late elementary school at that time. 
but this ghost, this woman always connected with me ever since I first saw her. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong camera. I have my phone on top of my camera. I keep forgetting. I I, I got to look here. Um, but ever since I first saw her, something changed. And it wasn't like I grew up or anything like that. Like I realized, oh my gosh, I'm attracted to girls and all this. No, it just something changed. It was like a spark. And it just connected with me. It made me feel warm inside. And it felt very familiar, which was strange. It was like I'd seen her before. But at the time, it was a brand new show. And nothing had ever been done like that before with that type of character. Like, you never saw that character anywhere else except that show. And there's just something changed. And at the time, I was like 13 when I first started watching that show. And um, I just grew attached to her, unlike anything I ever have in my life. It was like my first crush, and it's a cartoon, you know? It's kind of crazy to think of it that way, but that's the truth. And that was his passion. That's what he was passionate about. It's what he loved, and it's what he should have kept doing. You know, if you see his videos, his cartoon videos that he made, uh, I, 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 I don't really like them very much, but just because I'm not in that sort of thing that he was doing. But there are many people out there who like that kind of thing. And he could have gone somewhere with it if he just stayed up to it and worked really hard. He could have made it with that. He could have turned it into a very successful web series. He could have, he could have made it. He gave up, though. And whenever I, like, started feeling down and depressed, I thought of this character. Like, in later high schools when she started to come back into my life. Like, um... You know, I watched Danny Phantom in middle school, late middle school, early high school, but then I kind of drifted away from it. And once 12th grade rolled around is when I started to get, you know, depressed and venture off into this darker area. And this girl was just there all the time when I got into that darker place. And the character's backstory was she died in a house fire and she made this song called Remember. And it's a song that basically sums up her death. And I couldn't stop playing it. It, like, hypnotized me. And that's the irony of it all, is this ghost hypnotizes you with her music. And it just, it changed me. I can't even explain it. It was just, it hooked me. Reeled me in. And she was always there when I got into this dark, depressing place. And I just connected with her, unlike anything I ever have in my life. And that's when I started thinking about killing myself by burning myself, which I knew it wasn't going to kill me. Like it just, it was too risky to do. And I just, I just had that thought in the back of my head for years. Like, I know I'm going to kill myself one day, but when is it going to be? How many more years am I going to be alive? You know? And I thought, honestly, by 2015, I'd be dead. I didn't think I'd be alive much longer than that. But anyways... You know, and to my knowledge, I don't know that Randy ever told anyone he was actually going to kill himself. To my knowledge, I don't know that he did. I don't think he did. I would venture so far to say that he did not tell anybody, most likely did not tell anybody he was going to kill himself. And I believe that's how it usually happens. If someone is actually legitimately going to do it, most of the times they, don't, they won't tell anybody about it. They'll just do it. You know what I mean? But of course, there's always the risk. If someone mentions it, there's always the risk that they are actually going to do it. So I got through 12th grade and then I kind of drifted away from this character. Like she was a distant memory at the time when I started going into college. It just, she disappeared for a while. And I guess the ultimate root of all this goes back to, I'd say at the very earliest 2012, because that's when Tom Lynch died. Jeremy knows full well what it was like during that period but i believe that was his brother's friend who actually died when he was he was about a year older than him i want to say they were around the same age i didn't know tom lynch well at all but i knew him he was in a class of mine and i was going to work with him at mcdonald's when i applied there i remember this from his journal and i talked with them a few times you know like during our activity period at high school like during flex hour or whatever you know i talked with them a couple times and uh he was a great guy great kid and when I found out that he got killed in a car accident on the way to work or on the way to school rather 
that when mom texted me that saying that Tom got killed on his way to school, I can't even explain what that felt like. Something just broke inside of me. And I didn't even know the kid well at all, yet something just fucked me up. And I'll never forget it. I was in my college math class. It was college algebra. And the class ended. It was like quarter after two. And I saw the text when I got to my car in the parking lot. And then I just froze. Like something just broke. I I don't even know. Like I just blew a fuse in my head. And from that point on, I was just fascinated by death. And... That's just where it started. Like, I was always, like, interested in, like, learning about the afterlife and what could happen and all this. But that, I wasn't, like, a dark kid at that time. I was still, like, I was kooky. I was doing my own thing with my YouTube videos. And, you know, I just came and went to college. But, you know, I wasn't miserable. I wasn't upset. I wasn't depressed. I was just like, oh. You know, I just got to get through this year and then I'm going to take my major classes in college and everything's going to be all honky dory and things are going to be fun and awesome. And I wonder what he wanted to, to major bigger in. and better things and all this. And then once that happened, something just went in my head. What would cause that to happen? I mean, if his brother's friend died or the kid, he says he doesn't even know him. What would cause that? to? I don't know. Maybe it was because that was his first experience with someone he actually knew in person dying, you know? Uh, maybe that was it. I think typically people will experience will experience something like that earlier on in life. You know, I remember when I was little, I was maybe about nine or so, and uh, one of my best friends, his little brother, died. You know, and and that really dis disturbed me somewhat. But I mean, you know, I, I I didn't let it change my whole life. You know, uh, but then after that, I had several life experiences with with death. So I don't know. Maybe it's that it took so long for him to experience something like that. And um, I just remember that was one of like the weirdest drives home in my life. It seemed like it took an eternity. And I don't know. It's just uh, just because I guess it, it hit like so close to home. Like no one I never dealt with anyone who was, you know, a year younger than me dying. Oh, you he's know? younger. OK. And everyone deals with it in their own way. But. I just couldn't get it off my mind after that. And I started overanalyzing the living hell out of it. And I had Tom Lynch on my Facebook at the time too. So, you know, I started seeing all the stuff that got posted around the Dallas community on Facebook and I couldn't get away from it all. And I just kept getting sucked into it all. And I just wanted to know everything about it. I wanted to know what killed him. I wanted to know how fast he was going. I wanted to know if he died at the scene or at the hospital. I wanted to know everything was he well, that sounds kind of like morbid curiosity you know i think we all have somewhat of a morbid curiosity was he buried and it just one thing kept leading to another but not to, to another, that extent to another but i just kept that all to myself i didn't ask anybody this stuff i didn't want to go like to that extreme of asking details like that because that's not right you know but i had like you know, 300 people from Dallas added on my Facebook at the time. So it was all over the place. You couldn't avoid it. And it just fucked me up for a good while. I thought about them throughout pretty much the entire year. And I just kept going into this dark place. And I liked it. I wasn't afraid of it. I liked it. I enjoyed it. It felt natural to me. But... As the year went on, I sort of kind of dug myself out of the little hole that I dug, you know. I got back on track. Sure, my grades plummeted at the time, but I still managed to pass everything somehow. But, you know, it's just, it's what it was. And it messed me up for a good while. But, you know, the year went on and I met another kid in college, uh, Matthew Murray, which he was cool. Um... It was the fall semester of 2012 and, you know, he was in my video production class and I got to work with them on a few projects, you know, he was in my group and whatnot. And, um, what happened to him? I kind of grew a connection with him at the time. It was me and this other girl and him. It was me, Matt and Ashlyn Elmore. And we were like this little group, you know, we didn't like do shit together or anything, but you know, we talked in class and all that. It was like our little group. And, uh, the semester went on and 
you know, I got to know them a little bit more, told them I did YouTube stuff, and they started watching my videos, which was cool. And I uh, thought they were cool and started posting some of them on their social media, you know, and uh, like pictures from my videos and stuff. So it was cool. It was like, cool. I'm like, I'm growing a little bit. You know, I'm expanding my YouTube fan base. It's cool. And um, at uh, the, end of, uh, the end of the semester, I got word that he died in a car crash. And oh, another car I accident. didn't know at the time it was him, which was terrible. It happened in December. It was like a week and a half after the holiday break started. And, you know, I showed you where it was. Mom, I showed you. It was like a mile and a half from the store, you know. And people at the store were talking about the death of the kid that went to Tunkhannock High School. And I didn't even know that that was him. So throughout, like, throughout the entire month off that I had, I had no idea he was dead. I didn't have him on Facebook or anything. So I didn't wow. see anything on it. So what happens is the third day into the spring semester, I had the instructor that I had for the studio production class for my uh, my script writing class. And she pulled me into the hallway before class started. It was like, I wonder why he never tried to look it up to find out who it was that was killed. 9 a.m. class. And it went something like this. like, So how you doing? You, you heard about Matt, right? And I'm like, no, what happened? just clueless like having no idea like didn't think anything like really serious happened like maybe he broke a bone or something or i don't know and she's like oh uh well like really like concern <laughs> well over winter break he got in a car accident and all that and it, she talked to me for like a few minutes and I'm, I'm just like yeah i had like i had no idea and she's like yeah i was on the news and all this and it, uh it, that was that was it. That was the moment that everything changed. And I was never the same since. Literally, something just short-circuited in my head. Something completely broke. Something shut down. And it just completely fucked me up. It was from that day forward. It was like, I don't know, I want to say like January 17th or something, 2013. And from that point on, that year, bad shit started to happen. And I was always skeptical about the number 13. I've always hated 13 i always felt it was unlucky i never liked the number 13 what happens it's the most unlucky year of my fucking life 2013 you know, that happened i got word that matt died um pop 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 died and that was one thing but that was just kind of like it was expected to happen you know the yard caved in on the well pump in the yard and all that and flooded the basement and all that a week and a half after pop 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 died totaled my car 10 days after I totaled my car, Jeremy totaled his car. And then when I had your Jeep at the time, I almost wrecked that in the snow, almost hit a tree. And I look, one thing just kept leading to another, to another, to another, to another, to another. At the end of the year, my Mac fried. My hard drive failed. My graphics card fried. $700 hard drive fucking just dollars to fucking repair that. The other day. You one ain't thing, kidding. Just one after another, after another, after another, after another, after another, after another, you know. Sounds like a bad year. Some of it was just stupid shit, you know, life shit that happens, but it was like literally the worst year of my life. Make the next year better. Man. And that's just when I just, I, I gave I up, just lost control of everything. Like my mind started to get completely just dark as fuck. I just, I can't even describe it. It was just, it was the worst year ever. And that's when I just didn't want to be at the supermarket anymore. I didn't want to work anymore. I didn't want to get up in the morning anymore. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't care about anything at the time. Sounds like trials and tribulations, you know. Things get really hard sometimes. Life gets hard sometimes. And it seems like everything's just messed up. But it's when you're at your lowest point that you got to get back up and keep fighting, you know. Like Rocky says, it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep going. Rocky's right, man. Just watch Rocky. Rocky's right. Andrew Blaze. And I just I wanted to just do YouTube videos and that be it. That was the only thing that made me happy. And then do that and build on it. I just I didn't want to do anything anymore. That was a good time for a sip. And that's when Ember came back into my life. 
It was in 2013, around late March, early April. That's when she came back into my life. I looked up the episode again on YouTube and looked up the song again, and then that was just, that was it. From that point forward, she never left my life again. Ever. I played the song pretty much every single day of my life. And we gotta just listen to fell that down song. a hole of deep, dark depression and despair and nothingness into an abyss of just fucking darkness. I can't even explain it. And every day, it just got that little bit darker. From that point forward until the day I died. Until the night I died. And it's just, it's just, again, like I said, you have to find something that you're really passionate about that can drive you forward. That can be your motivation to live, you know? For a lot of people, that's like their families or their loved ones, things like that. Um, for some people, it's their careers. Uh, for some people, it's they, the purpose they feel like they have, you know? Or finding out they're good at something and then going with it, you know? It's all about finding that. Finding that is the most important thing, is the most important part in life. Is finding what can drive you forward. And everyone can find something that drives them and motivates them and gives them life. It just got darker. And I liked it. That was probably the scariest part for everybody else was I liked it. I liked this dark place. It wasn't scary to me. It felt natural to me. It was, it was home for me. Uh, touch my display here so it doesn't go to sleep. Just to make sure it keeps recording, you know. I'm recording my audio separately. It's on the microphone down here. Um, but this is just when things started to change with me in 2013. It's when I started, um, I guess you could say cross-dressing, which is something you never knew I did. I was cross-dressing ever since high school. And what would happen would be when you guys would go to your bowling leagues and Jeremy would go with you, which was every Wednesday, I would either film a YouTube video, you know, back in early high school, you know, 9th, 10th, 11th grade. I would pretty much always film a YouTube video between 9th and 10th grade on every Wednesday when you would go out the door. So I would either film a video or I would cross-dress. And that's something I have kept to myself my whole life. I never told anybody about this. And it's something that probably shocks you, but at the same time, it's like, well, yeah, you never had a girlfriend or anything like that. So I guess it's expected, but. Uh, so here we get like a glimpse of the inner turmoil that was going on within Randy Stare. You know, he, he felt like he was hiding this, you know, these inner feelings and emotions that he had, and he felt like he had to hide it from everyone else. And whenever there's a part of you internally, that you feel you have to hide from everyone else, it'll eat you away, you know? It'll eat you away. And that's the, that definitely just makes me feel a kind of sympathy in that regard. Of course, what he did was horrible, but at the same time, I feel sympathy for him in that regard, that he felt like he had to hide this inner part of his being from his family and from his friends and from the world. Um, I'm not sure why. Perhaps he was ashamed. Let's, let's continue and find out why. Mm. The more I wore girl clothes, the more I felt like that was who I was. Like I felt like I was a girl and I found out that I was. I was never meant to be a guy. I was just a female soul trapped in a man's body my whole life. And I couldn't tell you guys that because then that would lead to never ending jokes and, you know. And see right there, there, there he says it would lead to never ending jokes and that is is not right if if it would lead to jokes that that would be fucked up on on the part of the family on the part of the friends on the part of anybody who would make jokes and insult somebody because of what they feel internally you know that uh and that's that's, that's sad that he felt that way that people would joke about it because that would be fucked up you can't live your life like that it's like, how do you live? And I wanted to get sex change operations and everything. I really honestly did, but I knew it wasn't smart to do because it, it ruins your whole life if it's botched or if it goes wrong. And not everybody looks good after a sex change operation. 
And that's what I wanted to do, but I couldn't do it. And then I'm also like, well, yeah, but then that's not me, you know. I was put here in this body. I'm going to have to live in this body until I die. That's how it was. So I'm betting that's and a big part of why he, uh, why he killed himself. I bet it's a big part of why, because he just, he felt trapped in the man body. He didn't want to be in the male body. He wanted a female body. And he actually did believe that after he died, he would be a female ghost. Which, um, I'm not sure how he came to believe that that would be real. Perhaps he convinced himself because of what it's what he wanted so bad. I just, I always felt like I was a girl. Pretty much, I was always girly, you know. I just did my best to hide it over the years, but I am. Can't even explain it. Look at the posters on my walls. It's full of pony stuff. My Little Pony. It's a girl show. <laughs> Yet, they call the guys who watch it bronies, which I was one. It took me until 2014 to... No, I was... Yeah. No, it was 2015. 2015, I got into My Little Pony. But... It's mainly intended for girls, and look at that, I got two pony posters on my wall, you know. One was from one of the movies, which is, it's a crossover movie where the ponies become human. <laughs> so, that was different, but. You know, to touch on that just a little bit, I think that if someone likes a cartoon, that's perfectly fine. If someone likes a cartoon that's made for kids, even that's made for girls, so to speak, like My Little Pony, Sure, at first it seems strange, but, I mean, if they're not going to hurt anybody, if it's not doing anybody any harm, sure, it may seem strange to you, but what, what bad is it going to do to you? How's it going to harm you or anybody else? Now, of course, if we take it to the extreme, and it's somebody who actually, you know, likes children or wants to hurt children or is attracted to children, things like that, that's where the issue arises. But if, if an adult man just likes a cartoon that's, I guess, aimed at little girls, that's perfectly fine, you know? Again, it may seem weird, it may seem strange, but hey, it's them, it's their life, it's not your life. So, you know, to chastise and, and make fun of people and all that, which I do myself, I, I, but I, I'm, all about, I'm all about fun and laughing and joking and sometimes mocking. But, you know, I never actually aim to just really insult and talk shit about someone because they like a cartoon that's for kids, you know? It's all about being cool and just being accepting somewhat, you know? Being accepting. It's 2017, you know? We need to evolve as human beings, as a, as a human race, and just be kind to each other, you know? Anyway. Hopefully prevent more things like this from happening. You know, if he didn't feel so trapped because of the society that we live in, maybe things could have been different for him, you know? I'm not making any excuses, but I'm saying when things like this happen, there's always so many ways that... Could have gone different. Could have been prevented. I don't give a shit about that. But it's just every year of my life since 2013, I just felt more and more feminine. Can't even explain it. Look at look at the bathroom. Look at where my stuff was. You'll see there's a girl's Venus razor there. There's the skin to mitt stuff that girls use to shave their legs and arms with. Every three days since like 2016, I've been shaving my arms and legs and entire body every three days. You wonder what I'm doing in the shower for so damn long? I'm shaving my entire fucking body. I wasn't jerking off in there. <laughs> but nobody ever questioned that. Which I don't know why. <laughs> I hit. So right here you can tell that he's upset that nobody ever questioned him about it. Maybe if they had questioned it, maybe he would have opened up with them about it. You know? Uh, let me guess. Let me think here. If I had a son... And I noticed that my son seemed feminine and shaped his body every three days or so. Would I ask him? I don't know. Or, I don't know whether it would or not. I don't have any kids. I never will. I'm fixed. But uh, but it's too bad his parents didn't ask him because it seems like he wants he wanted them to ask him, you know, whether or not he was uh okay, whether he was comfortable, if he was. I guess he wanted them to question him as to his uh, you know gender identity ask him if he was okay with that I did it for the longest time i I, kept I just wonder if he would have been open with him about it or if he would have denied it and lied it lied about it at the the girl razor in my freaking desk over there and i just got tired of hiding it i'm like well they're gonna have to eventually know anyway so i just started leaving it on the counter but nobody 
question it, which I couldn't believe. That shocked me. Yeah, he's upset that they never asked him. Ever since 2016, I've pissed sitting down. <laughs> Just one thing kept leading to another and to another and to another. I mean, right now, look what I'm wearing. You know, it's it's always been right under your nose, but I've kept it hidden away from you the entire time. I've had girls' t-shirts in my freaking dresser in my closet for like two and a half years or so. Leggings. That's all been here. It's been in my closet, under my bed, in the top drawer of my dresser. Run well, well, it's a good thing that they weren't actually going through his stuff. You know, they were giving him privacy. But at the same time, it sounds like there was just a lack of, uh, you know, watching over him and learning about him and communicating with him. Seems like there was a serious lack of communication between Randy Stare and his parents. It's under your nose. You never saw it. And I just, I couldn't stop buying the stuff. I didn't buy much of it, but, like, I bought, like, I'd say three pairs of leggings and two bras and, like, three T-shirts that were girls. And it's just one thing I'll say is, like, that white stain on the floor, like, that splotch you'll see on my carpet, that was an ember thing. I just, I wanted to make my skin as white as possible to look like her. I wanted it to be completely white, so I bought this this body paint, which was like, I don't even know what it was. It was like latex shit that like... I've never heard of that. It was like glued to your skin and you gotta peel it off. And it got on the carpet and then it got freaking in my body hair, which like almost never came out at the time. What little body hair I had at the time anyways, but um, that stuff never came off. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, you're over there sleeping, and here I am at 3 in the morning covering myself in this latex shit. And, yeah, that was a fail. <laughs> but, it was just all Randy this was very right troubled. under your nose. And I kept it hidden away. So I guess he felt like they didn't care about um, him. That's what it seems like. I'll just keep going through the years here while I can. Um... As I said, 2013, Ember came back into my life, and she was never out of it again. So, the end of 2013, I really didn't see, like, what more I could really do with my life. And I'm like... We're going to stop this at 30 minutes. We'll be halfway through. One of my YouTube videos. I can picture myself making YouTube videos for maybe at least another year, and that's it. And that was me nodding at the fact that I would be killing myself in a year. So... Wow. I thought I'd be dead in 2015. I didn't think there was any other possible way I'd be alive and what happened was something that shocked me was 2014 was the best year of my life hmm. in terms of YouTube content in terms of my mind and my thoughts and my general direction in life and at the same time it was it was just love hate because of the job shit I had to deal with finding a full-time job and all that but 2014 was my favorite year of my life and I just, I didn't think I had much left to offer. I thought I was done. Like, there's nothing left in the tank. This is it. You know, I've done everything I can for YouTube. And I just, I don't want to do this anymore. I was winding down my life in a way. And I made a video in January of 2014 called Amnesia Rape. Which, if you ever look up these videos, you're going to be like, what the fuck was he thinking? Because at the same time, I don't even know what I was thinking. I'll have to check some that of these out. Videos, but I just went with it. And I got this idea at work. I was picking up a big heavy box off the top of a pallet when I was still on, you know, second shift and first shift. And I almost dropped it on my head. I'm like, that would have sucked. You know, and then it gave me an idea for a video. And the whole video was about me having a weight set drop on my head. I lost my memory and... Over the years, I made these videos of me talking to these inanimate objects that I had lying around. And, hmm. you know, it was just routine. Like, I knew they could talk and all this. And obviously, I did the voices for them. But All righty. That takes us to 30 minutes. We're halfway through the video. Uh, I'll see you guys next time on part two, and we'll finish this up. Uh, very interesting. Getting deeper into the mind of Randy Stare. So far, it just sounds like an obvious lack of communication between him and his parents. Uh identity crisis going on within him um confusion you know 
great suffering and thinking about death and wow well with that having been said i need to make something happier so i'm gonna get off of here now i'll see you guys later until next time i'm bay shaman hit the thumbs up huh how about that and i ain't kidding hey there bay shaman here you guys ready for a uh, part two of this Randy Steer suicide tape. Uh, this is his goodbye to his parents. We did part one last week. Now we're picking up with the second half of this video. And there's actually, I believe there's more after this. So, we're going to have three or four parts on this. This is our part two. Without any further ado, let's resume. When I got hit on the head and lost my memory, I totally forgot that they could talk and all this and... You know, I had these inanimate objects tie me up to a chair, and one of the characters was this stuffed whale character, which was He's talking gay. about a YouTube video that he made. Hey, which I don't know what made me, like, make the character gay, because I'm not gay, <laughs> but it just, it worked. And the fucking toy starts fucking my ass and having his way with me, and then my memory comes back, and all the while, the one inanimate object, which is a frog... Uh, what do you think about someone who would make a video like that? Do you think that there's undeniably some sort of underlying, you know, cause behind why they would make something like that? I understand that everyone has their different opinion on what's considered art, what's considered, you know, entertaining, what's interesting. But some things you hear and it just you automatically just really assume there has to be an underlying reason why someone would make something like that, you know? And then he it's interesting that he said, I'm not gay. He says he's not gay. Um, and he actually, I don't, I don't think he was gay. He hated men. He really hated men in his journal. It's obvious he hated men. Um, very interesting. This is why I think Randy Steer is so interesting. Some of you guys really don't like him and think he's boring as shit, but I just don't think he's boring at all. How can someone be boring who, uh, is obsessed with this cartoon that they create that made a tons of YouTube videos that, uh, that said they were a female trapped inside of a male's body and that went out and killed, um, you know, innocent people and then ultimately himself. There, I think there are so many interesting things about Randy, and that's why I do these. I think he's interesting. Uh, but hey, if you don't like him and think he's boring, I understand. It's okay. Let's, let's continue. The frog was recording it on a camera, and, you know, it was going to get posted on the internet and all this shit for the video, and... You know, my memory comes back, and I'm like, what the fuck's going on? And I guess I just find this so much more interesting than Ricardo's videos. Like, Ricardo's videos, I get very bored when I try to actually watch them and talk about them. But I don't get bored when I watch Randy's. You know, it was just, it was a totally, like, fucking out there video, but it was dark stuff. You know, at that, up until that point, I like I'd never really stuff. done anything, like, really dark. And that's when the darkness started to make its way into my YouTube content. And I'm actually going to go find that video and watch it, and we might even do a review of it, because that sounds interesting to me. It sounds very interesting. So, I only made four videos that year, which is hard to believe for me, because for YouTube, you you don't know. Um, Jeremy's texting me right now. That's hilarious. His brother. I can't say what it is, because then it's going to ruin Father's Day. Ha ha. Um, yeah. Sorry to bring that up. <laughs> I just saw the text appear on the screen. Go away. Um, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, the, the video started to get darker. And up until that point, I had not done dark stuff. But I I made only four videos that year. And in my YouTube career, I have made like 10 some videos every year. Like 10 to 17 videos. And then once I got into like college is when it started to slow down, you know, because I had to work more often and all that. So Wait, 10 videos a year? He would make 10 videos a year? You know, YouTube recommends that you make a video at least once a day now if you actually want them to start favoring you and sending your stuff out to people. But 10 a year, huh? The video started to decline, but in 2014, I only made four videos. And 2014 was a huge milestone and a step up because they became short film videos. Um, sure, the video I just mentioned with the amnesia rape and all that, that was like a four-minute video or whatnot. But shortly after that is when things got longer paced and drawn out and slowed down and it was totally different and i used my skills in ways i never thought i could and it was like i was achieving my dream of making movies in a way even though it was just me with a video camera but um so that was the first video i did of the year the second was what ultimately like ultimately led 
to my demise, which was a video called The Search for Remember. And check that out. I told you about the song before, the song Remember. Um, the worst part about that song was for 10 years, we only had this horrifically degraded mono mix. It was worse than bootleg quality. The song sounded like shit. It was as if somebody held like a 2004 cell phone up to a computer speaker and recorded that. And that's what Damn. got uploaded onto the internet. Now, the song he's talking about is, uh, if I'm correct on here, it's Remember. It's like the theme song for Ember McLean, his character from Danny Phantom. And that character, she supposedly died in a fire. And she, I believe she was bullied at school or something, something like that. Something bad happened at school, and then she died in a fire. And that song's supposed to be about Remember Her, you know, if I'm correct. I don't think that's what happened, but... I, you know, back in 2004, this is before iTunes was the standard mainstream way of downloading and releasing music. So you had songs that had lower bandwidth and all this and ultimately shitty quality. And this track sounded shitty as fuck. I can't even describe it. There was like, there was no depth to it at all. Saf, shitty and, as fuck. Like it literally sounded, besides like holding the cell phone up to a speaker, it sounded like it was playing in an underwater cave or something. Somebody That's horrible. described it like that, but... Um, anyways, long story short, um, somebody found the song in the mastered high quality, you know, and they sent it to me. And the thing was, nobody knew that this was actually on the internet anywhere. Like we thought it was just like at Nickelodeon studios on their hard drives or something, but turns out the singer who sang the song had it on her website in her portfolio section for the songs and work that she's done and all this. And, hmm. um, somebody found it and they sent it to me and i was the first one to upload it to youtube in hd quality like that and, and his video where he uploaded that on his pioneers productions channel that video has like millions of views like it has tons of views it's insane i had an edit of that song over the years that i kept like retouching and making better from the show and i made a music video out of it with the shitty track so i just threw the updated track in there and uploaded it and over the years, that video got over a million eight hundred thousand views. You ain't kidding. One point eight million views in three years. That's insane. You ain't kidding. For a guy like me, a girl like me. But but, but really, if it comes down to it. It's because it was the Nickelodeon show song. Like, uh, I don't know. I'm not trying to downplay here, Randy, but. The video is clips of the Nickelodeon cartoon with the Nickelodeon song. So, I don't know. I'm not trying to downplay you, brother. I'm just, I think you got to point that out. You got to remember that. This is, I couldn't believe it. At the same time, I could, but I was like, holy fuck. So, this became a marketing tool for my future videos because I could start putting like links in there for my stuff. But, you know, that's besides the point. But, anyways, Ember just took over my life. And everything just seemed like destiny at the time. It's like, okay, I was the first person to upload this. I was like the first person to know about the song being found in HD. You know, things were really looking up. And it just felt like fate. You know, hmm. I can't even explain it. That's interesting. So I made a video called The Search for Remember, which was a video about me about to kill myself because I couldn't find the track and all this. And, you know, but it wasn't really over dramatized because I actually did want to start thinking about killing myself at the time. But, um, yeah, I made the video, and the singer actually saw it, which blew my mind. Um, the singer's name is Robin Kermsey, and she's done work for Nickelodeon or, like, shows like Fringe and stuff like that. She's done vocals and stuff for that, and it just blew my mind. It's like this woman saw it and uh, even added me on Facebook afterwards, which was really cool. So, yeah, it was just... Like, it felt great. Like, I felt like I had another purpose, like a new purpose to keep living. And it was nice. And then the next video I made was what ended up fucking my hand up, which was Extinction. It's when I stabbed that frog at the end of the video and lacerated my tendon. Wait, his, um, I saw his finger right there. Remember how his, his head, his fingers damaged? I think I just saw it. Frog at the end. Yep. So he claims that his finger was stuck like that because of the, um, when he stabbed the frog. 
So I guess it stuck like that. It's pretty crazy. Fucking my hand up, which was extinction. It's when I stabbed that frog at the end. We're going to have to look at that one together, too. End of the video and lacerated my tendon. Um, You guys were at a baseball game during that, and I had to hurry up and get it done before you got home because I didn't want, to, I didn't want you to see me covered in fake blood and stuffing from stabbing this stuffed whale and all this and just, like, completely psychotic. And I'd highly, like, advise caution watching that video because it really starts showing, like, the psychotic side of me in it. Like, it, it's really disturbing I'm going to check it out. She said it's called Extinction. I'm going to have to check that out. Um, But in terms of, like, performance and all that, it, it was one of the best acting performances. I say acting loosely, but one of my best performances on video. And... That was the first video that Ember appeared in, that I started using my own version of her in there. Um, and then I just made a few more videos after that. I'll just, I'll try to keep this like short and sweet from now on. I can talk about this forever. But I made a few more videos and that eventually led to me going into animation and doing cartoons. And it's all thanks to that character, that Ember character. I just felt a connection to her. I felt like I've known her before, even though she's a cartoon. Spiritually, I just felt connected. It's like she just, like, grabbed me and wrote me in. I can't even explain it. And It's so interesting how he felt such a... It's like an obsession. He had an obsession with the cartoon character, the female. You know, with Ricardo, he had an obsession with Bjork, who was a human. But... I mean, this was an imaginary character. I mean, to him, she was real. She existed within him. But it's just, wow. That's when I just got into the cartoons. And this is the biggest, like, what if, but it goes back to fate and destiny. This was when uh, I had the hand surgery done. You know, I quit the hospital job and all this, and I got the hand surgery, which ultimately led to me going to night shift and all this. And then this happened, you know. It's all fate. Things happen for a reason, no matter what people say. They do. It's meant to happen. Major things need to happen in your life. and Well, some things are very unnecessary that happen, and they only happen because some people are very extremely evil, and, and they carry out their acts of retribution, and that's when these horrible things happen. It's not because they have to happen. They're very preventable, but it's because of the evilness within some humans, humans, that they carry out these horrible acts. That was one of them, the hand surgeries that was supposed to happen. Because had that not happened, there's no way I would have gone into animation, or at least not the way I did. You know, I had a lot of time to work on it during that period of time. That's when I developed everything and, you know, worked my skills up with it and started making stuff out of it. And that was called EGS. That's when the EGS content started. That's when I stopped doing videos on film and just did cartoons. And I called it EGS, which stood for Ember's Ghost Squad. So this poster behind me, that's EGS. That poster is EGS. The one that's above my bed is from the actual Danny Phantom TV show. Except I got rid of the background and made my own background for it and all that. But that's literally what the character looks like. That's literally ripped from the show and then photoshopped out and to think every single time i've gone to sleep she's hovered over me as i slept you know that was the point of that but i could talk for hours about egs and what it all means and the long and just of it is egs is just meant to be be who you are, not give a fuck what anyone thinks about you, and just live, you know, your existence. Your well, if you could do that, that would be awesome. But the whole killing people thing, that's the fucked up part. That's the fucked up part. You can be yourself, do what you want to do. But when it comes to you affecting and hurting other people, that's where things get fucked up. You know, I'm all for accepting people and shit. But as soon as you start hurting people... That's where the fucking problem is. Ghost, you're dead. You know, that's the whole point. You die and join that ghost squad. And it was just, it just happened. I can't explain it. It was, it was just fate. 
like some people would be like what a far-fetched concept that is like how the fuck do you come up with something like that you know it's just when i was in that dark and depressing place that's what ember led me to it was like i was meant to do this it's as if the almighty powers above was saying this is what you're supposed to do and that's what i felt like my purpose was it wasn't to get a fucking full-time job and start a family and live a long, happy life. You know, none of that garbage. It just... that. I mean, he had no desire whatsoever to support himself. You know, that's something we get from him. He talks all the time about how, oh, you kept wanting me to get a full-time job. and That's part of our society. If you want to be able to support yourself, you're going to have to do that. You know, and you're well into your your young adulthood, but you're into your adulthood. There comes a point where you need to take responsibility for yourself. Does he not realize, did he not realize he was depending on his parents for everything? I mean, parents take care of their children. They raise them. You get to a certain age, you need to start taking responsibility for yourself to be an adult. I mean, what, how, why do you feel entitled to have your parents continue taking care of you once you're well able to take care of yourself you're old enough you obviously have the intelligence to speak to communicate effectively that just pisses me off it wasn't who i was and then the more i started doing the cartoons and all that the more i just didn't give a fuck what anyone thought i just did whatever and those videos i made were very disturbing if you ever do watch them i made these videos called egs tapes which was meant to be as realistic as possible which is the ghosts recording their thoughts while they're, most of the time, while they're still alive. Like recording and documenting their thoughts and feelings on cassette tape or iPhone recordings and all. And I think that's actually interesting. The fact that they have journals, so to speak. Like, you know, it's imaginary, but it's journals from the characters. I think that's very interesting. I think journaling itself is awesome. And video journaling is really cool. I want to get into that shit myself. This is kind of motivating me. Of course, mine won't be some manifesto tapes like this shit. I'm just kidding. All this and, you know, it's before they died and they would they would die. You know, you got the backstories and all this and the tapes would be what would be on the Internet. So, like, you would understand how they were feeling during this period of time. And what I did was I threw all my thoughts and emotions into these scripts and every single video I did. And then people loved it. You know, like, nobody makes content like you do. It's because I... I was realistic with it. I was authentic with it. I made a, an EGS tape called Conspiring a Massacre, which is me venting on the fucking tape saying, like, you know, people need to die. Man, we can review those, too. This is just some interesting shit, man. This is just very interesting. All right, we are back. I needed to drink in my cup. Let's continue. There's fresh souls all over this town. You need to die. We're going to kill you and all this. And I wrote this other one, Conspiring a Massacre 2, which was a different... It was a, a girl who recorded it for me for the character Rachel. Um, I'm saying things like, you know, just going off about people that, you know, for Rachel's character, people they went to school with. It was a high school shooting, which was Columbine inspired, which I'll get to soon, but... Um, Rachel's character, she's like me. I hate everything. Everybody pisses me off. I just want to be left alone. I want to kill people and just live my life the way I want and all this. And I wrote stuff like, So he know, just said, I want to kill people and live my life the way I want. I mean, like, killing people in video games and things like that, uh, I think that's a guilty pleasure that we all have. Well, not all. If you, if you like video games, there's a good chance you enjoy killing people in video games. But... I'm, uh, I, I really think that's completely different from real life. In real life, people can actually, you know, lose their lives. People can have um, horrible pain from losing loved ones, and, and they're going to suffer. Like, real life is completely different from video games. They're two different things. Real life and video games are so different. Now, here's a question for you. I think many of you can relate to that. In video games, it's fun going on Grand Theft Auto, going on a rampage and killing everybody. But not in real life. But here's a question, though. If they, had an, if they had a virtual reality simulator where you could do that, where you could go on rampages and kill everybody and shoot everybody, and it's virtual reality, and it's totally real. It's like you're plugged into the Matrix, right? And you could do it there. Of course, nobody would be hurt in real life. It would all be fake. It would all be imaginary. Would you do it? 
Would you? I can ask myself that right now, and honestly, I don't know if I would or not, because the thought of acting that out, like, in a virtual reality, it kind of, I think it would mess me up internally in my head. I think it would, like, scar me. You know, in video games, you can always tell it's fake. You can always tell it's you know, just a video game. But to do that in real life, like, I mean, not real life, but a virtual reality, I don't think I would. I don't think I would. Um, but would you? Very interesting. Let me know. Leave me a comment and let me know if you would or not, because I want to know. Let's continue. Just bitching about the high school kids, like, you know, do you ever shut the fuck up on your social media? No one gives a rat's ass what you're doing every five goddamn minutes of your worthless, depressing, slutty life, all that shit. Oh, Stuff like, oh, I'm going to show up at your house at midnight, tie you to a chair, incapacitate your fucking parents, slit your wrists across the alley, pierce your eyeballs with fucking sewing pins, watch the blood drain ounce by A little tip to anybody else who gets agitated by social media updates, like, you know, someone always posting on their Facebook what they're doing, you can unfollow them. Like, just do that. If it upsets you that someone updates their shit all the time, just unfollow them. Or unfriend them if you want to. It's up to you. But just complaining about it, it doesn't do anything. By ounce out of your toxic attention whoring veins. You know, I went brutally in depth with the stuff. And the girl recorded it for me. It sounds like you ain't kidding, Randy. You know, I paid her to do it. I This girl was an actress. A YouTube actress, but, you know, did voiceover work, and I pay... I pay girls to do things, too, sometimes. No, I'm just kidding. But I'm saying... I paid her to do it. And she ended up doing a few more projects for me after that. But, you know, I wrote all this dark, brutal, morbid, grim stuff into my videos, and people ate it up, and they loved it. You know, they didn't realize that I actually meant it all. Nobody knew that. I started posting on all my social media how I really felt. I changed my name because I didn't want anyone here to see it. You know, Blaze. That's when the Andrew thing started in late Andrew 2015. Blaze. That's when I just I changed my name because I've always hated my name my entire life. I hated the name Randy. I always hated that name. You know, to, whenever I hear the name Randy, I think of there was actually a guy that came around. We called him the Meat Man, and he sold meat. Like it's, it's kind of humorous, but it's true. And his name was Randy. And I always when I hear Randy, I think of the Meat Man. He has this big guy, nice and strong with a thick beard and a mustache and long hair, and his name was Randy. And he always had the best ribs, man. I got those ribs. I got pork. I got... And my mom would be like, no, thank you. We don't need any. And my dad would be like, no, no, talk. Come on in. What you got? What you got? And they would buy all this meat from the meat man. Right? <laughs> I love my parents. Yet I couldn't tell you that. Last year in 2016... I came this close to saying I wanted to legally change my name. I came that close. You should have done it, Randy. If you hate your name, Randy, then you should have changed it, man. I, I think it would have been a good idea. I almost did it. But I didn't want to have to go through the whole process of going to the social security place and getting fingerprints at the police station and all you this shit. It. And it's just like, well, I'm probably going to be dead in a year and a half anyway, so what does it matter? So Damn. the more I just sat deep in thought... I felt like my name was always Andrew for some reason. You look more like an Andrew. And I called myself Andrew Blaze because I loved fire. Ember was a fire character. You know, her hair was always on fire. And it just connected with me in that way. And I just thought of Andrew Blaze and it felt so familiar too. It was either going to be that or as time went on, I thought like Rachel. Like I thought my name was always Rachel. If he was a girl, if he had been, like, born a girl, I think he would have looked like a Rachel. But, I don't know. But that's when that started, and that was... That's because I knew a girl named Rachel when I was little. I knew a girl named Rachel that looked like a female version of him. was the lead character for EGS. Me. And it was just my ultimate statement for my life, you know? I just did whatever I wanted and whatever I could for the cartoons. I wasn't perfect with the cartoons. There's stuff I look at... That I made is like, wow, that looks shitty, you know? But I got better at it. Like, the last video I ever made, the Westboro High Massacre, that video blew me away. Like, what I was able to do. Got a booger, Randy? So, it was all made by me, besides, like, some of the voices. Like, all the cartoons you see on that channel were done by me. I made all that. And... That Westboro High Massacre one that he's talking about, a few of you have suggested that I do a review of it, and I'm going to. I really am. 
It just won't be on YouTube. When I do, it'll go on BaseShaman.com. That's where I put everything that can't go on YouTube, which is a lot. I guess I should do the inevitable deed now of talking about what made me do all this because there's so many factors that go into it. I can't give you an exact motive. That's always going to be the biggest question. Why? You know. Amber was always there in this dark place, like I mentioned. She fueled me to do this. I was like, she told me to do this. The female cartoon character told him to go on a, a killing spree. You know, do it for the ghost squad. You know, we need more souls. Kill people. You are mentally, you are very mentally disturbed to think something like that, to believe that, and to go about and, and do it. It was that. There was just the overall hatred and general stress of being here on this planet. Just my hatred for everybody in the human race. Wanting to kill people. Not wanting to deal with anybody anymore. I just wanted to kill people. One of the other biggest was Columbine. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. But I doubt most of you know fully in depth what it was. The Columbine High School shooting was April 20th, 1999. And last year, around June, was when I just got sucked into it. And I've heard about it in high school or early college or whatever, like just the reference of like, you know, school shootings, like Columbine and all this. And I never really looked it up until like late 2015 or early 2016. And it just hooked me. It grabbed me, it sucked me in. And I loved it. it. You know, I did a few videos about Columbine months and months ago. And uh, when he was still alive, I'm wondering if he ever saw what I made or commented on it. I'm going to go check real quick. I'm going to check my emails and see if he ever commented on my stuff. I'll be right back. Keep your fingers crossed. Okay, I just checked all of his usernames. And no, he never saw any of my Columbine videos. Well, he never commented on them. Goddess. Blew my mind that two teenager high school kids could do what they did. And their names were Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. Eric Harris was, I think, 18 and Dylan was 17. It happened on April 20th, 1999. They walked into their school with trench coats on. Eric had a sawn off shotgun. And a carbine rifle. Trench coat Dylan mafia, had baby. A semi automatic pistol and a sawn off double barrel shotgun. And they walked into their school, killed 12 or 13 students and a teacher, and then killed themselves. And they conspired to do this for a year. And mostly the biggest cause of it all was bullying or just hating the world in general when they got arrested for breaking into a van and all this. But they were generally good kids and people don't see that they see them as these monsters that just killed people in their high school and wanted to blow the entire place up and kill as many people as possible but deep down they were victims and i started to realize this and i just got attracted to them not like in a sexual way or anything but they were victims until they became monsters by carrying out these actions you see like were they victimized prior to this yes but what they did in the end, that's what turns them from a victim to a monster. You're missing that, Randy. Just grew fucking in love with them. And they became my role models. They became my inspiration. And that's not good by society's standards. If you start showing affection and sympathy for fucking high school shooters... You're going to be fucking locked up. So I had to try my damnedest not to post about that on social media. But if you looked, I made a fucking natural selection shirt. That's the shirt Eric Harris wore when he killed people. Dylan had a shirt that said wrath on it. But Eric Harris had a white t-shirt, black text, natural selection. And I bought fucking three of them. Yet none of you knew what it meant, which blew my mind. I didn't want to tell you that. So I kept that under wraps, but blew my mind. None of you knew what it was. That's a warning sign. They got me into guns. 
Like I always envisioned shooting myself with a pistol. Like when mom said she was going to get a gun, I'm like, finally, I can get out of here. That's my ticket out of here. And when she got it, I'm like, that gun looks fucking weak. Like, I guess it, it could, it could totally kill you, but I wouldn't count on it to end my life. It just seemed like a really like pussy gun. And then once I got more into Columbine, I got into shotguns. So the whole reason I got that Sonop, not the Sonop, it's not a Sonop shotgun, but you know, the 12 gauge pump action shotgun was because of Columbine. That's what Eric Harris used. He had, it was an old shotgun. It was like 20 to 30 years old when he had it, but um, it was a Sonop shotgun that was like 18 inches long, you know. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to buy a shotgun, saw it down and all that, and it would be powerful as fuck because when you saw down shotguns, it makes them more powerful from close range and it could just devastate whatever's in front of it. But then I saw the one, I'm like, well, that looks exactly like what I would want to do to it. So I bought that one. And what you didn't know was I bought a second one about two and a half, three weeks after. And he actually named them after his favorite uh, his characters might be wondering why well at the time when i got the shotgun i just intended on using it to kill myself in my room here that's what i thought was going to happen that's what i envisioned happened for years that's what i envisioned happening for years anyway and you know i started documenting everything i i started a journal which is what eric harris and dylan klebold did before they killed themselves over that year or two they had a journal so i started keeping my own writing down my thoughts and just because I thought it was cool, you know, and it's a nice way to express yourself without using. Speaking of his journal, we're going to be continuing that coming up here too. I think we're on chapter 11 or 12. I'm not sure, but uh, we'll be continuing that in a video coming up soon. The internet, nobody can track it. Nobody can know what's going on with you. It's a nice private way of doing it. It's just simple pencil and paper, you know, pen and paper. So I started doing that. I'll drink to that too, Randy. And as Crystal time went light. on, I just, being I was so sucked into Columbine, I'm like, maybe I can do something like this. I can do a shooting, you know? But then I kept thinking, I was like, well, what, what can I shoot up? The only thing I, that, like, that came to my mind was my college campus, LCC. But I'm like, I wouldn't kill more than two people. It wouldn't be worth it. And plus, I'd be a one-girl crew. I'd have to do it all by myself. There'd be no way I can pull that off and kill, like, more than two people. So, one-girl crew. So I kind of put the thought aside and I just envisioned killing myself in my room here. And that was it. And as time went on, I'm like, holy fuck. I could shoot up my fucking supermarket, you know? And it just... It dawned on me like that. I was like, whoa. Because... With night shift, it's a freebie. It's a gimme. There's no customers there. No one can stop you. And it was like a dream come true scenario. But I didn't want to risk it with just one gun, you know? Like something can go wrong, the gun can break or jam or whatever, and you're screwed. You can't off yourself, you know? So I had it all come down, believe it or not. To a coin flip. To a coin flip. This is the quarter I used. To decide my fucking fate. You can believe that as much as you want. But it's the truth. I got it. I got it all on video. I set up the camera. Out in the yard. The backyard. And it was going to be the best out of three flips. Originally it was going to be like whatever the first flip was. Was what it was going to be. But I decided to do the best of three. So. I ended up flipping it. Four times. It this, came this whole fucking story is like something straight out of a movie. You know? Like some lifetime movie that you just can't stop watching even though you know you're wasting your time but it's just so interesting it's like a movie down to the very last coin flip believe it or not it did and the first flip was tails if it was going to be heads i would do it here if it was going to be tails i would do it at the store first flip was tails second flip was heads i believe and then heads tails whatever you know it was tied so it came down to the last coin flip, landed on tails. So I documented that entire thing, called it fate by coin flip. So that's when I decided to get a second one, which you never knew about, bought a second shotgun. So I 
kept it under my bed all this time. Imagine being his parents and watching this. I mean, what would be going through your head? Wow. And it was the exact same shotgun except shorter. It was 18 and a half inches, which is the bare minimum legal limit for the length of a shotgun barrel. So the one that you, you know, you went to get with me was 20 inches. That one was 18 and a half. And, um, I gave them names. The, the first one I bought that you know of, I called Rachel. And then I called the smaller one Mackenzie after Mackenzie West. Not that one. This one. Mackenzie the, the other was one is him. another reason why I did this. <clears throat> and you can call me crazy all you want, but spiritually, she's my soulmate. She's my girl. That's who I'm going to spend eternity with. And it's who I've, who I was with before I was sent here. And I rediscovered her last year. And then she just started talking to me in my head ever since. And she was always there for me throughout my life when I didn't even realize it. And I write about her in the journal. I talk about her in these tapes I made before doing this. And, you know, she's my girl. She's my dream girl. It's who I'm going to be with. And ultimately, ultimately, it's what was the final nail in the coffin of ending my life. And she's everything I could ever ask for in a girl. Again, imagine if you are the parents and you're watching this, your child, your deceased son, talk about this kind of stuff. I just can't comprehend. I have no idea how I would feel. Um, now, when he's talking about she's his dream girl, he says, he said in the, he hates men. He's not gay. He doesn't like men. But um, females, is he attracted to females? Or, sir, he considers himself to be a female. So does that mean that he is, uh, is he lesbian? Is he sexually attracted to her? He says she's his dream girl. They're going to be together forever. It seems that uh, he's, she's everything he could ask for in a girl. It seems that he actually sees a relationship there, that they're going to be in a relationship for eternity. Interesting. I don't know. I don't know if he considers himself to be a lesbian female or because he doesn't consider himself male at all. Mackenzie's my girl. And as much as you might find it hard to believe in this poster, I'm the one wrapping my arms around her. That's me. That's what I envision myself as. And you can believe that as much as you want, or you could just call me fucking crazy. It doesn't matter to me, but that's how it is. You watch the video, if you ever do, the Westboro High Massacre video. I mean, I, I show it, I do the intro on like every like legit skit production I do. But it's a send request track called Comeback Song. And the very first time I heard that song, it just connected with me in a way. Unlike anything that I ever had in my life. When I filmed them at LCC for my, my uh, special projects workshop that I took instead of an internship, you know. And... From that day forth, you know, I filmed a music video for them and all that, and that led to some cool things, but that song was what changed my entire life. I animated it for EGS. For every skit, you'll see that intro. You know, they all say I'm broken. They never meant anything to me. Can't they just leave me be to follow my own fantasy? I'm lost here. I'm jaded, stuck in my own misery. This is my comeback song. It's only meant to fucking prove you wrong. I am so far from being famous. I know you're not the same as me, and that's the way I want it to be. My friends talk when I'm not around. They say I'm lost and not yet found. Can't they see I'm just like them, stranded and broken? You know, stuck here. I'm fading. Can somebody please help me? You know, it was all there, and I was like, wow, this is me. Like, it just summed me up in a nutshell. And you always saw me as having, like, no direction, you know, just lost and stuck. People think I'm weird and messed up, broken, you know. It just all connected with me. And I used it for the theme song of my videos. And who knows where that's going to go after this happens. I don't know.
But that was the ultimate statement for me. Yeah, the shooting was one thing, but that track is... It's perfect. So you'll hear... Andrew Blank's voice coming out of my Ghost Squad character. So, you know, it's a trip. <laughs> Queen was one thing, but this is taking that to a whole other level. But that's why I couldn't show you this stuff. I couldn't tell you about my cartoons. I couldn't show them to you because you'd, you'd monitor the living hell out of me. You'd think I'd be like on the verge of ending my life. Gee, I wonder why. You know, if you saw what I did on there, it's all dark, disturbing stuff. Yeah, I made a funny video or two, but you look at the backstories for the characters. The one ghost, Harmony Ingram, her name is, died from slashing her wrists, cutting her wrists. Matilda Ramsey died by being buried alive. Rachel Shadows and myself died in a school shooting massacre. Mackenzie West died by being kidnapped, raped, butchered, and murdered, hacked to pieces after being stalked. Alex Gebhardt died in a car accident. Blood from his skull was dripping into his eyes while he was still alive. Celesta Reynolds, heroin, heroin overdose. Sydney Secor died in a school shooting. It's just brutal stuff. And I love it. Ever since I got into it, I always loved dark stuff. And Columbine was, besides Mackenzie, Columbine was the last missing piece of the puzzle in my life. And I just felt a connection to Eric Harris. And he was pretty much the mastermind and the brains behind Columbine. And I just, I read his journal. The police released that stuff back like in 2002 or something. But I read it. And I was like, holy shit. Because like, it was like someone actually like understood how I felt about the world and society. Like, my hatred for people, wanting to wipe out all the weak and worthless people in the world and all that. And it's just, it blew my mind. And I wish I could have met him. I really do. And for all I know, I knew him before I was here. Spiritually, we, we, we might know each other, you know? I don't know for certain, but he was a huge inspiration for me. He inspired me to put the duct tape on the shotgun, on the pistol grip. That was Eric Harris. I fell in love with the suicide photo from Columbine. It's on Google. It's all over the internet. Look up Columbine High School suicide picture. You'll see Eric Harris bowed over to the left like this. And Dylan's like, like this with his arm over his chest and one hand on the gun. And that's in this picture behind me. I drew it. I drew my own version of that suicide picture. I literally traced over it and made my own version of it. If you look really close, you will see it. But unless you know exactly what it looks like, you won't even notice that it's there. But there's two angles of that suicide photo. Like one's like the angle I mentioned. It's like an overhead view where he's over to the left like this and Dylan's like laying like this because... The police had to roll them over to check for bombs after the massacre happened. The other picture was taken, like, head on. You could see, like, Eric like this and his hands kind of covering his face. But, like, his head is, like, completely obliterated. And then you can see, like, the wound on Dylan's head and all this. And I just, I loved it. And it wasn't sexual or anything. I wasn't turned on by dead people or corpses or anything like that. I was attracted to ghosts, yeah, but... I fell in love with this suicide picture and that gave me a purpose. It's like these people were heroes to me, which might just give you the fucking shivers and creeps right now thinking about that. Yes, these two kids were heroes to me and they killed 13 people and a teacher. All right, that wraps up this one. <clears throat> Man, absolutely insane.
Uh, I'm going to have to see you guys on the next one. It's just very dark. You know, watching him in his room like this, discussing all this, being so open about the darkness that was within him, it's extremely dark. Uh, shit. I'm going to have to do something happier now to lighten up the mood a bit. Hope you enjoyed this. I'll be seeing you all very soon. Till next time, I'm Bay Shaman, the webcast king, and uh, to all you humans out there, I ain't kidding. Remember the name, Amber McLean. Remember my name, I'm Andrew Blaze. Mackenzie West, you were the best. Remember that name. Remember that name. I'm Andrew Blaze. Do it for the Ghost Squad. All right, that was fucking awesome. Turn this shit off. Hey there, Bass Shaman here. Felt like rocking it out to a little bit of that there Ghost Squad music. What the fuck is wrong with me? Um, you guys ready for some more dark, depressing, Randy stare analyzation? I am. In case you can't tell that already. Let's, uh, let's get started. Part, uh, this is our part three. We have part three, then we have part four. Let's get started with part three. Turn you up, Randy. Just gave me a whole new purpose to live. And that's when I started animating that massacre video. And I'm pretty sure I told mom about it right after the surgery this year. Saying, you know, I'm going to pitch it to animators so they can help me do it. It's like going to be like a high school shooting video. I might have said that. I don't know for certain, but you kind of forgot about it. I wonder what her reaction was if her son told her that. Like, hey, mom, I'm animating a high school massacre. High school shooting. I'm animating it. Yeah. What do you think of that, Mom. I don't know. I'm not a mother, but if I was, I'd probably be a little concerned. But I couldn't do it all by myself. It just took too damn long, and I got sick of working on it. So it got really a bridge to, you know, the vision of what I really had in mind. If you haven't seen that massacre video, look it up. It's called a. Uh, <clears throat> it's called Westboro High Massacre, and it's interesting. Like in the beginning, this there's a segment where he switches from the good animation to the stick animation, because he, he wasn't able to finish it in time. But it's the darkest thing I've ever made. And I loved it. Really did. And it's all thanks to Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. But... They just... They inspired me. You just... Just be thankful I didn't start making pipe bombs. You know, I very easily could have. You just go to a hardware store and get the stuff. I wonder it. why he didn't. It's not hard. <clears throat> but Since he looked up to them so much, you know. That day during the shooting, they had 99 homemade bombs that they made out of just typical stuff. BBs, gunpowder, duct tape, propane tanks, all this stuff, and they made bombs out of it. I very easily could have gotten into doing stuff like that, but I didn't want to risk hurting myself over it. Oh, okay, but that explains done it. it. Probably could have. Yeah, you could have. I'm glad but you didn't. Columbine was my Bible. It was my guidebook. It was everything. I analyzed the living hell out of it. I watched all the documentaries on it. Saw what went right, what went wrong. You know. Obviously now, people are trained to respond faster to shooting incidents. But at the time, it was contain a situation... That's why so many people died during Columbine was because the SWAT didn't enter the building until like an hour after the shooting started. Nowadays, people enter like right away. But because this is totally that. different than a school shooting. But, <clears throat> you know, it's just, it was my guidebook and I loved it. I loved everything about Columbine. I just could not get away from it. I think it's because of the bullying, right? Randy was bullied. Um, I know he 
puts that into his works a lot, the bullying type thing. And of course, that was part of the Columbine, is the bullying. Bullying needs to stop. It just sucked me in. I grew desensitized to gun violence. I saw gory pictures of people with their faces blown off. You know, the suicide photos of Eric and Dylan and all that. You know, I just grew desensitized to it all. Even when I first saw the suicide photo, it wasn't like, oh, like gross or anything like that. Like, mom would probably be like, ew. But like, I just, I loved it. It fascinated me. If you don't know, Columbine is the famous school shooting with the library shooting. That's where it, the bulk of the shooting took place, you know. Shooting at the kids under the tables and all that. That was Columbine, which was parodied in American Horror Story in the first season. The murder house, Tate's character, Evan Peters. He was the school shooter and he killed the kids in the library. That was inspired by Columbine. And the eeriest thing was, that was the first horror story episode I saw when I walked downstairs to let Bruno outside or bring him at, like back in. That was the episode that was on TV, and I saw that. I'm like, whoa, that's like, that's Columbine or something at the time. And I didn't even like really know what Columbine was, but I guess at the time I knew about the library shooting. And that's what episode it was. Which goes back to fate and all that. Like I said before, it's it's weird when you think of it like that. But it just why are some people so like sick? You know, some people are so sick, and they need help, but they don't get it. Shit, it sucked me in. But I'm not sorry that it had to be this way. I'm really not. You're sick. You could always say, what if, what if, what if, what could we have done? You know, how didn't we know? And that stuff drives me crazy, but it was all there in front of your face, you know? It's not their fault, though. It's not your parents' fault for not asking you, you know, why you're in the shower so long or what the white splotch is in your carpet. It's not their, they don't have to do that. It's up to you. You're 20, what, 23 or 24? You're an adult. It's not up to your parents. Don't blame them. This is sickening. You know, your parents bring you into the world. And they raise you. He obviously lived a very privileged life, you know. They took great care of him. They were there. And you still find something to blame them for. That drives me crazy, you know. You need to appreciate your parents. If they raise you, you know, if they stay in your life. And, uh... Things like this just pisses me off. They never should have fucking had you. Welcome to reality. Yeah, the reality is that you never should have been born. And I documented the entire year pretty much through video or audio recordings. If you ever want to listen to them, it gives you an even better understanding about everything I just talked about. I talk a lot, but that's also mainly because I won't be able to clarify anything down the road with it all. So I had to make it like as specific as possible in the recordings. But like from May, not May, from March through May was when I documented like every week pretty much on audio or video. I always wrote in my journals, you know, that's there too. Cause I couldn't always just record. He always talks about his, how he's gathered all of this stuff together. It's his story that he left behind. He's so obsessed with this story that he left behind. Like, uh, like he's proud of it. You know, it's finally going to get him some attention, which is what he's always wanted. And he's so proud that he's left behind this story. That's, that's sad. That's so sad. Audio whenever I wanted. People were always home. So the journals were a great way to do it. Especially without having to vent on and social his journal. Videos. If you haven't heard his journal that I've been reading, I've done like the first nine or ten chapters. The journal is absolutely ridiculous. And the journal shows exactly who he was on the inside. Which was absolutely ridiculous. So you can't say like, oh, I want to kill people on social media. You'll get arrested. So... Fortunately, that 
being my profiles were Andrew Blaze from then on out, you never saw my social media stuff. I didn't have Terry added on anything, you know. I was in the clear from all that, so nobody knew that. You know, nobody knew what I was posting about. So this is why I could never tell you about the videos I was doing. I could never show you the cartoons. I could never show you that stuff because you'd be overwhelmed with concern, you know. So. And rightfully so. I just, I couldn't risk showing you that stuff. And some of it, you'll be like, wow, that's amazing. Even though it's like, you know, it's brutal and dark, but that's amazing that you were able to make that, you know, maybe, I don't know. But seems that he wanted some appreciation from his parents. You know, he feels that they were neglectful, you know, but, uh, <sighs> you'll always find something to complain about. You know, you'll always find something to complain about. Just be happy with what you got. You know, you had two parents that loved you, that cared about you, that tried to get you to make something of yourself, but you refused to. I mean, you look at this. I made this. I made that. Even though that back, that's when I was still shitty with facial stuff. Like the nose is always like lower than the mouth. That's whatever. But you know, the poster over there by my VHS tapes. I made that one. You know, I made this stuff. My mouse pad I made. I drew all that stuff. You know, what, I made that. And did you want your parents to show you that they were proud of you because of that? I was an artist, and I, it just <clears throat> took me until now to realize I can do that stuff. I was a visual artist for videos and stuff, but I never knew I could actually, like, draw. And that came very late in the game. I wanted to get into guitar, too, but it was too late. By the time I got it, I just I didn't have the time or the patience to learn it. It was pretty much because you were giving up, just like you gave up on life. A waste of time. But you know, all the times I went up shooting at that shooting range, like you having no idea that I filmed it all. I filmed every time I went up there, filming everything. Or like the time when Jason's dad was up there, like he said to you, Mom, he's like, he was blasting off ammunition. You know, I I fired at least 100 rounds every time I went up there. 100 shotgun rounds. That's a lot. Try shooting a shotgun 100 times. <laughs> you get used to it over time, but fucking 100 shells in a shotgun? Good Lord. So the warning signs were always there. They were there from the beginning. I'm just a good liar now. So I see that he wanted them to help him. I think I'm starting to see that he wanted his parents to save him from all of this shit. Maybe if they had intervened somehow. It's not their fault. It wasn't up to them. This was all him. But <clears throat> it seems that he was internally crying out for some sort of help. Maybe they could have helped him. Maybe they could have understood him. But they didn't understand him. They didn't know anything about this. It's sad. And... I just... I wish I could have told you some stuff. I wish I could have opened up to you about certain things, but I just... I couldn't for my own sake. I just couldn't do it. I just, I've always been a girl. I just, that's one of the biggest things I wish I, I could have told you from day one. But I didn't realize that until I discovered Ember. She's what brought that out in me. I just, I didn't just wake up one day and be like, oh, I'm a girl. I wonder why he felt he couldn't tell his parents that. I mean, of course, it doesn't sound like something that you'd want to tell your parents. But if you, I guess he just, he didn't have a good relationship with his parents. But uh, I think in a healthy relationship with your parents, you should feel comfortable telling them anything you feel internally, such as something like that. Um, maybe they had given him a reason to believe that they're not okay with that sort of thing, uh, which would be sad. That'd be very sad if a child tells their parents something like that and the parents, you know, they're not supportive of them, which I'm sure happens a lot. But uh, I don't know. If I ever had kids, I'd be supportive of them no matter what. Great. Amber's what brought that out in me. I wanted to look like her. I wanted to dress like her. I wanted to be her. And that was back in like 10th grade. 
He could have gotten a sex change. He could have done that. You know, he really could have. Yeah, he really could have. And he probably would have looked like a tall girl. <laughs> Why am I like, like I'm actually visual. <laughs> Let me continue. She was my first crush. And she ultimately was my final demise. And like I said, it's going to be quite ridiculous to think like this could be headlines, you know. Man shoots up place over cartoon or something, you know. You didn't even get that much media attention, really. Like, most people still don't even know who you were, and they never will. You have no legacy. The few people who do know about you think you're a complete joke. It's crazy to think about, but... It's the truth. It's the honest to goddess truth. Goddess. And you heard me right. I said goddess. I didn't say God. I said goddess. I know you. I know. I've said it in front of you a few times on accident. But I don't believe in God. I believe in a goddess, which is Ember. Or Ember was his god? Is? Or if not Ember, it's, it's a goddess that's a beautiful feminine spirit that creates life and all this and puts you where you need to be and it's god but it's a goddess that's what i picture we don't know what god looks like or anything like that but i believe in a goddess look like ember i believe in a goddess i very quickly started to drift away from christianity once i got out of high school i just didn't. oh so he drifted away from christianity so he was a christian before all of this that's interesting i had no idea he was a christian prior to this for some reason, I just always pictured him as being, um, you know, not believing in any sort of religion. But it's interesting. He was a Christian before all of this. Yeah, that's very interesting. I would never have guessed that. That's crazy. Because I, 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 I was Christian when I was younger. I was pretty strong on my Christian beliefs and things like that. So, interesting. I buy it. I never could buy it. I could never believe that the son of God was sent to earth and he died and gave his life for us and was resurrected from the dead. I just, it was a fairy tale to me. I, yeah. I think, I think Ember McLean beat sounds a lot more realistic. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't believe it for a minute. I'm like, there's no fucking way. And it's like, well, how come no like miracles like that happen today? You know, you see in the Bible, all these fucking stories. It's just, I, it's bullshit. I don't mean to crush anyone's faith or anything, but it's just, it's bullshit. It is. Okay, so his animosity towards Christianity, towards this, his ex-religion, I think that played a part in his anger and upsetting him and causing him to lose his marbles. That's very interesting. Because I get really mad when I think about it sometimes, you know? I always related to whenever I finally found out there was no Santa. I think I was like four or five and I found out there wasn't a Santa. And I was like, what? Oh my God. It was like, like X-Files theme plays in my head. I don't know. Then I had another revelation like that when I was about 19 about, you know, religion and everything. And I was like, wow, you know, and you feel kind of like you've been lied to for so long. I don't know. I feel bad for him about that though. This whole religion thing that, that kind of sucks. You're believing something that was written in a book a millennium ago. You have zero proof that it exists. You just have your faith. And it's just, I couldn't buy it. I couldn't buy it. I'm not atheist. I just don't believe in Jesus Christ or any of that. Just believe in Ember McLean. Garbage. It's a load of fuck. He believed in Ember McLean. It really is. Ember was goddess. Yeah, you can tell. He's he's seriously contemplating that shit. He's really upset because of it. I guess he hadn't moved on past that point in life where, you know, his ex-religion upset him. You can tell. He's serious. He ain't kidding. <laughs> so... Damn, that sucks. 
I don't really know where to go from here. I've had to tell so many people about this. Like, I've had to write, like, ten fucking emails to people I care about, saying virtually the same thing over and over again, and just rewording it. You want coffee and paste? And... It feels like time, it's like brother. the 50th time I'm saying this stuff, because it is. After all the recordings I've made over the last few months, and it's just... That vein, though. I could talk forever about it, and I don't want to. This is an hour and 15 minutes long already, you know? You ain't kidding. So what I'd recommend is just listening or watching to those tapes I made. Lockjaw, job, really. That's... I'm sure I'll leave a note somewhere saying where the stuff is, because I can't just say where it is right now. This is Cut six in. days before I intend on doing this. Pull the Ricardo on it's that It's June one. 1st as I'm recording this, so things could obviously change. But it's just one thing I honestly hope that you guys do that would make me happy. What's that? If you watch this before you do it is give these posters to fans if you do intend on just throwing them out. I wonder if they did that. I wonder if they did. Do you think they did? Let me know in the comments. I want to know if you think his parents actually gave those posters to fans or if they just threw it away. I'll tell you, if that was my kid and he did some shit like that, I would burn all of that shit. That's what I would do. I wouldn't give it to no fucking fans. I would fucking burn it all. I would get rid of everything that belonged to that kid. You know. Talk about a disappointment. Like, holy shit. How much more of a disappointment can you be to your parents than to do some shit like that? That's a disgrace. I don't want those to just be thrown in the garbage. Because they're not garbage. They're, they're my life, you know. I would hate to see this room get scrapped and gutted and everything and all the posters thrown out, but that's what's going to happen. I have to accept that, but, you know, this room was something special. You know, the posters completely border the room. It looks amazing in here. He should have done what Ricardo did. He should have recorded all these journals, all these video journals, and documented all this stuff, and then, instead of going out and killing other people, just having killed himself, if he had done that, he would not be seen as a villain. But he was so obsessed with Columbine, he wanted to try to be like them. He should have been obsessed with Ricardo. He could have been in there playing Bjork. Uh, what is that? I re remember you. I remember you. That song's so sad and beautiful and creepy now. Nobody's room looks quite like mine does. If you really think about it, it's very unique. And I would want my fans to have the EGS posters. You know? I mean, you'll have my phone and all that. You could just post on my social media. <laughs> Would anyone want these? You know, you could charge money for them if you want, but it's not much point. I don't know who will pay for that shit. But there's the one by my VHS tape. I'd pay for it. I'd pay like 20 bucks. I wouldn't want that shit in my house. What the fuck am I talking about? Rack, there's the one behind me, and then there's that one. And I autographed the back of them. I autographed the back of all of them, so, you know... They're worth something. I wonder if that shit's on eBay. The fuck am I talking about? I'm not going to waste my money on that shit. The fans. I'm not a fan. Fuck I you. emailed James about this, but... Um, you could give my hard drives to him if you want. Your hard drives? Um, because it has all my video stuff on there. It has all my Embers Ghost Squad stuff. It has... How many terabytes? Everything I've made. I'll reformat that shit. high school on there, you know? And it's not worthless stuff. It's all my stuff. Oh, how many times my life? So you can give my hard drives to James if you want, because he what about was Alan? the closest friend I had. I mean, we drifted away, but I mean, we're still friends. But I out. emailed him about it, saying like I would want you to have my hard drives because he would know what's on them. He would know what it is. He would know what's what and all this. So instead of Ask just throwing James those out for hard drive, for mine tomorrow. And obviously, you'll sell my Mac and all that, but I would want James to have that stuff. 
James Ellis? If he declines, then fine, but I would oh, reach out to oh, him LA. first. If James doesn't want that shit, dibs. I need some more storage space. James Schwemmer. Oh, okay. I thought you said James Ellis. Girls. Because besides him, there's no one else in my personal life that knew me. <laughs> Ember. Like on a regular basis like James did, so. Um, trying to think of what else. Like, oh, I don't know. Obviously, the guitar and the keyboard and all that you can sell for money, which is worthless. Money is worthless. If money's worthless, can I have however much you had? He, he probably didn't have anything. He didn't really like to work. He had about 15 minutes left. Let's go. Can't explain that enough. It's giddy. Can't express that enough, rather. Money's stupid. It really is. Not when you take your money and buy food for kids in Africa who are starving. Really? Like, that's something good that you can do with money. Don't hate money. There are good uses for it. Um, I don't know. You can do with it what you want, but I wouldn't want to see it thrown in the garbage. That would crush me. Well, I would have thrown all that shit away. I wouldn't want to see it. Actually, I probably would have put it on eBay. <laughs> burned either. This stuff was my life. It's what made me happy. It was virtually the only thing that made me happy. And if you would just throw that out, that would devastate me. Goddess. I'd probably haunt the shit out of you for it. Oh, do shit. It. Never mind. I don't want to throw it away. Damn. Don't haunt me, dude. What are you thinking about? What I mean, this is the way it has to be. And I'm not sorry about it. I'm yeah, not. I know you're not. Jerk. So think of all the stuff we did. Hey, Randy, you left your cell phone too close to the microphone. So all that interference is in the background. Beep, 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 beep. All the times we had. And who would have thought that somehow, some way, we'd have to say goodbye? Oh, he's recording with his phone. That's why. Uh... But being I was on night shift for a couple of years, it just it made it that much easier to do it. Like it just it's it aggravated me when I knew people were home when I got home. It pissed me off. Well, maybe you should have gotten your shit together and moved out of mom and daddy's house then. So <laughs> it pisses me off that I come home and my mom and dad are here. I mean, it's their house, but fuck. Piss <laughs> Come on, dude. I got it. It got easier to accept that. And like I said, I documented the whole process of it all. Like As more time went on, I got more frustrated with life, and then I just became more accepting of my fate, you know. But I'd be lying. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't afraid, you know. You can't be fearless of death. Everyone has a little bit of a fear of it. You ain't kidding. Lockjaw, ready. I'll drink to that shit, too. Purple drink. But this is just how it has to be. You ain't kidding. And looking back now, you might realize, geez, I, I, I don't know how I missed it, you know. Goddess. But now I can see. You might just start having flashbacks in your head of certain things, like certain situations where it's like, wow, that was one of them. Or that was a warning sign right there. Or, you know. I've always felt young. Always. I always felt like a kid. I never grew up. You know that. I've always been a kid. Spiritually, I feel like I'm permanently 16 to 19 years old. That's how I feel. And that's when I honestly <laughs> wanted to die. 
Jamona. I wish I could have died when I was like 17, but... You've seen my childhood. It wasn't my time yet. A little MJ gasm right there. But, you know... I know this video really has to be hard on you, watching this. I've been envisioned making this for years, you know. You ain't kidding. And I can't believe it right now that I'm actually doing it. You shouldn't, brother. It's very surreal. It doesn't feel real at all. Love you. But it is. Sure. And... In all this, I just... I wanted to show you that, like, anybody can do this. You can be, like, a saint, an angel your whole life, never get into trouble, and then just fall down a, a dark hole like this and do this. wonder what you're going to be reincarnated as, or what you were reincarnated as. I can talk as, to you, like, for hours about the why and the why and the why, but it's all there in the journal. All you got to do is read that stuff and listen to the tapes that I recorded over the last few months and things will become a little more clear or things might become a little more confusing. Put that beer down, brother. You don't need that beer. You had enough. Put it down. But that's what I was destined to do. I've talked about the meaning of life in one of the tapes. Um, meaning of life with Randy Stare. Hello. Today we're going to talk about the meaning of life. Goddess. I think everybody has a soul contract. You know, this is what you're expected to do, and this is what's going to happen, and this is how you're going to die, and all this, and this is your purpose, you know? Did Ember tell you about that? And everyone has one of those. You just need to rediscover it throughout your life. Mm -hmm. You might not realize it right away, but... You eventually do, and some people are just meant to be, you know, old aged and die. Some people are meant to live 80 years. Some are meant to live only 16. Some not even that long, you know, like four years even. And some have higher agendas like myself. Like, I think after this happens, like, that'll change the way people view things. Like, how to prevent stuff like this happening, like, happening again, you know. That's what I kept thinking of. Because when you think about it, it it was too easy. That was the beauty of it all. What what should have been? You're saying it was too easy. So what do you think they should have? Like police at every um at every grocery store throughout every night, like in your small town. Is that what you think they need, Randy? No one could stop you. How do you prevent that? What? More gun control? Is that what you want, Randy? Are you a fighter for gun control? And the answer is you can't prevent it. You can only kidding. endure it. You ain't kidding. It's the truth. You can't prevent mass shootings. That reminded me of when Elliot, like, flashing. <laughs> it's only fair. Watch. It's the truth. You can't prevent mass shootings. You can't. No matter how hard you try. And I originally wanted to do it in September of this year, but I just didn't want to risk waiting that long. And also the f isn't that when Ricardo did what he did? Let me, let me find out real quick. Yes. Ricardo's was September 12th, 1996. That's crazy. One day after nine 11, but a couple of years before the fact that I couldn't wait that long. I was done with life. I just was done. And I also knew, like, the longer I put it off, the more of a risk I had of getting caught with it, you know. Social media, like, I've always heard, like, you know, like, the FBI or the police can, like, monitor and track you on websites and all this and keep an eye on what you're posting about and what you're doing and the places you're visiting on the internet and all this. And um, the more I did it, I just felt like I couldn't risk going much longer. I mean, I was uploading all this stuff to to the media fire page throughout this entire endeavor, and I just kept thinking, like, what if the police are tracking this stuff? Because you never know. 
I don't. So what, Randy? You think that that we all need to be tracked even more, so they can keep an eye out for people like you? Shit, man. Think they ever did? Cops Too probably have they no didn't. clue about this. So. The biggest beauty out of it all was I had a bit of a safety net because it was uh, like a show, I say loosely, with the EGS channel, you know. I could have just played it off as just being a character or something, but the truth was it was actually real. But being that it was stemming from the show, it was a bit of a safety net for me. So that bought me a lot of time. It really did. And it's just, I'd highly recommend listening to those recordings. Like some of them go on for an hour and a half, but why not? What do you have to lose now? Listen to them. What if his parents didn't even listen to him? <laughs> like they're like, fuck that shit. I don't want to hear all that Learn shit. Learn a lot about me. You really will. Like back in December of 2016, I said like, I can only picture me like, living another year and a half or so. But that gradually started changing from two years to September of 2017 to July and then to June. Just kept going. So I just, I couldn't live anymore. I was done. I just couldn't live anymore. Well, that's perfectly fine, Randy, but why'd you have to go kill innocent people? Every day, every night rather, it's just, just the thought of being alive pissed me off. Having to abide by the laws of the living and abide by fucking clocks and work. All right, we know why he did it now. Fucking clocks. If I had one in here, I'd hit it. And authority and having to make money and just being... Tied to a fucking leash, you know. I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't. It's called First World Problems 101, baby. It's not who I am. I was never at home here. I never felt at home on this planet, ever. Like when you don't have anything else in the world to complain about. Hey, complain about not wanting to be on this planet. And I knew someday it would have to end. And it's surreal to think that in a few days it will. <laughs> it's very surreal. But like I said, I've, I've desensitized myself to most of it. I've become comfortable with it. I've accepted it. And it feels real. As time has gone by, like as the weeks have rolled down, parts of me have been dying. And it just feels like it's, you know, it's real. And I just, I can't see anything beyond this year anymore. It's all black. Can't see the future at all. Because I'm not in it. You know, last Thanksgiving it was... When I started to really start to show it, you know, I didn't want to deal with anybody. I just sat in my room and I worked on my cartoons the whole time. It was the Unleash the Candy video. And I was working on that. I hate that video. <laughs> I did a review of it. It's on Basham.com. I hate that video. It was meant to be out for Halloween. I couldn't get it done in time, so it took me until like nearly mid-December to finish it. But, you know, everyone's here and all that, and I didn't see anybody on Thanksgiving last year. I just sat in my chair at my computer and animated the whole time. And they stick just completely candy. locked myself away from everybody else because I didn't want to deal with anybody anymore. I hated everybody. I still like Grandma and Pop Up and all that, but people piss me off. I hate humans. I've always hated the human race. And then especially when we have large gatherings like this, it pisses me off. I hate people. <laughs> you know, I'm not big on people either.
But I don't want to go around committing massacres and shit. I just kind of stick to myself most of the time. I wanted to kill everybody. Well, shit, dude. That escalated quickly. Dude. You know, you wanted me to be in... Mom, you wanted me to be in photos and all that, and I just said no. Damn, that's fucked up. His mom is like, Randy, come take a picture with us. He's like, no. And then he closed his room like, unleash the candy. I just... I got sick of being told what to do. I've always hated being told what to do. And I just had enough of it. I'm like... I'm going to live my life. He's like, I hate these people trying to tell me what to do. I mean, you know, they, they brought me into the world and they took care of me for, for 24 years and they fed me and housed me and clothed me. And for some reason, they think they can tell me what to fucking do. Unleash the candy. If I don't want to be in family photos, I'm not going to be in family photos. If I don't want to participate in Thanksgiving, I'm not going to participate in Thanksgiving. If I don't want to get you anything for Mother's Day, I won't get you anything for Mother's Day. That's so fucked up! Like, I was fine until you said the thing about not getting your mom anything for Mother's Day. Last year, I completely locked myself away from that, too. I didn't even see you that day. I fucking drove around for like two to three hours before I even came home after work. And I locked myself in my room and said I was going to bed. Didn't give you a hug, nothing. It's in the one. He had some issues, dude. This year, I almost didn't get you anything again. I just fucking threw a few dollars in the freaking lottery like ticket machine just because. I don't want to have to go through it again because then you start getting worried about me. And especially now, I had to really watch what I did. So I sucked it up. I almost didn't even want to go out for freaking lunch that day. Glad I did, but I almost didn't want to go. Are you talking about Mother's Day? He's like, I, I almost didn't even let you take me out to lunch for Mother's Day, Mom. <laughs> Come on, man. It's just... I didn't care anymore. I was done. I mean, like, even when Ricardo was, like, you know, done with life and everything, he still talked a whole lot about how much he loved his mom and everything. Come on, Randy. just I just became this evil dark ghoul ain't kidding and with each passing year it just got worse now you still don't look like a ghoul though I don't think he looks like a ghoul he looks more like he'd be like from Rivendell I look like dad I honestly Wish would fucking kill himself. Ooh. Shit. He ruined my life. He ruined my fucking life. Damn, that F word though. He ruined my fucking life. Damn, dude. Can drop fucking dead. Dude, he hates his dad. Holy shit. He's not kidding. He hates his dad. Holy shit. What the hell did his dad do? I know he just tried to get him to make him work, try to try to get him to become successful at something, but shit, Randy. When all that high school bullshit started, it was inevitable. It was when what high school bullshit? I don't want to started? deal with them ever again. Damn, we're, we're we're new revelations in the Randy story. Shit happened in high school, and that's like the start of him hating his dad. We're at 30 minutes. We're going to end this. We're going to pick up on part four tomorrow, and we're going to find out why Randy Steer hates his dad so much. Um, All right, very, it's getting interesting now. My goddess. Hey, until next time, everybody, I'm Basham, I'm the Webcast King. And I ain't kidding. Look. Hey there, this is the most beast of shamans here, and you guys, right now we're about to get started on this here Randy Stare Part 4. It's the last part of our series, um, it's the last part of his video on this on his parents. You'll see the new subscribers that I've gained over the past uh, day or two popping up over here. Thank you, you all. I hope you enjoy this content. I know I sure do. It's going to be kind of emotional. I was checking this video out 
and it's a little emotional. Uh, yeah. I also have the latest subscriber up on top. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you guys, let's let's get started. All right, let's let's get started. Ready? Get set. Begin. When all that high school bullshit started. Bring you up to date. He's about to tell us. I believe he's about to tell us why he is so uh, against his father. It was inevitable. It was... I didn't want to deal with them ever again. Once I started having lousy grades and all that and applying for jobs and it just... I fucking hated them. Didn't even want to look at them. <clears throat> well, God damn. Um, it sounds like his dad really tried to push him to become something, to make something of himself. And that's what fathers are supposed to do. They're supposed to push their kids to be successful. They, no one wants their children to be failures in life. You know, that sounds like, uh, he was trying. Maybe, maybe he didn't go about it the right way, it's possible. But with Randy's mindset, I'm betting his father did go about it the right way. And Randy just didn't want to listen they don't want to hear it. And once the full-time job start, like stuff started starting and all that, I was done with them. I had enough. I'll never forget it. I talked about it in one of the tapes. It was before I had the hospital job. I guess it was like July of 2014. He wanted to go out to dinner with me, which I thought was nice. You know, it got me out of the house anyway, so I'm like, okay. But I fucking hated driving with Dad. I always hated going places with him because I could never talk to him about anything. Because I never connected with him once high school started. Jeremy did. I connected with Mom. But I could never talk to him about anything. I didn't connect with him at all. So that's a huge part of this now we're seeing. It's a huge part of why Randy's stare was damaged internally was that he lacked the relationship with his father that he wanted to have with him. That's very sad. With nothing besides football. That was it. So every time we would go out, it's like, I didn't, I didn't know what to fucking talk about. You had to have the radio on. I couldn't talk about anything. He'd try to make small talk, but I'm like, this is bullshit. It's just, I'm your fucking kid, and you don't know anything about me. You don't know how I truly feel about anything, and I can't tell you that stuff. And then all he fucking seemed to care about was, like, me getting a full-time job and making money and then trying to move out of the fucking house and start my own life and all that okay. shit, which I knew I, never, I was never going to do. So Randy felt that his father didn't give a shit about anything he cared about. He didn't even know, and he didn't care to know. That's how Randy felt. Randy feels the only thing his father cared about was him getting on with his life and getting out of his house. And Randy probably felt like he was being, you know, pushed away, rejected, instead of loved and embraced. You know, when you're offering advice to someone, if they're like younger than you, if they're your child, and you're offering advice, you need to give that advice from a place of love and comfort and understanding. You know, when you do it from a place of, you know, the authoritarian figure, um, but with a lack of compassion and love, it's not going to be well received, you know, not going to be well received. So let's, let's keep going. And we went out to dinner the one That's night. Too bad. It was over Brooke. And we just went into the job talk. I tried my damnedest to avoid going into that. Man, I think this whole thing would have been avoided if he had had the relationship with his father that he wanted. That's a huge part of uh what what caused randy to feel so upset uh, was the lack of relationship with his father you know perhaps that might even have something to do with his uh his feelings that he said he was a girl you know um i'm not saying that everyone who has those feelings i'm not saying that something's wrong with you know all of them that's that's not at all what i'm saying i'm a very accepting compassionate person now, with the case of Randy, though, he went on a on a rampage, you know, killing innocent people and believing that he was going to die and become the ghost girl that he truly was internally. Now, for that to uh, 
for that to be going on, something was obviously not right in there. And perhaps part of his wanting to be that ghost girl, feeling like he is a ghost girl internally, once again, comes from these family issues. It just started up. You know, like, have you been applying anywhere? I'm like, well, yeah, but I haven't really heard anything. It's like, well, you better fucking have something by the end of the year. Okay, so anger. So his father was sending out anger in this whole thing. That That's a mistake. You don't send out anger when you're trying to guide and direct someone. I mean, I know that you can get upset, but you need to control that anger and remember to send them your advice, your words from a place of love and understanding, especially if they're your child. Better fucking have something by, like, by fucking October. And this is in the fucking restaurant, at the bar. There's people on both sides of us hearing everything we're saying. That's embarrassing. And he's fucking, like, almost yelling it in my fucking face. Yeah. Fuck off. Kiss my fucking ass. I didn't even want to finish my fucking dinner after that. I didn't. You can eat a fucking cock. Yeah, I think that's where most of this anger comes from, actually. That's what it seems like now. Most of the anger comes from uh, his father and the lack of the lack of uh, a relationship. All about money, isn't it? And guess what? Money's fucking worthless. Drop dead. I don't see why it was such a big fucking deal because I was still part time at the store. I was still making money, you fucking whore. I was making fucking money. I wasn't just sitting around doing nothing. I was virtually full time at the fucking store as a part time fucking worker, you goddamn cunt. And you make it out to be like I wasn't doing anything with my fucking life. Kiss my fucking ass. You know, today, this morning, in the vlog I did, I talked a little bit about energy and how we transfer it to others. Um, that anger, the energy that his father transferred to him was multiplied, you know, tenfold within, uh, within Randy, you know, and it's because of who it came from. If, if this energy had come from someone on the internet, on YouTube, you know, it wouldn't have been that important and it wouldn't have been that magnified to Randy, but because it was coming from one of the only people who Randy truly expected to love and understand him from the from most likely the one person who mattered the most in his life when it came to you know wanting to be understood because it came from that figure his father figure that is why it was amplified the way it was that is why it hurt randy the way it did ultimately that's what led to randy doing what he did i never forgot it either it was burned in my fucking memory for months. You're a worthless cunt. I'm really curious what his father would think while watching this. I'm sure that he loved his child. I mean, it's very rare that a parent doesn't love their child. Perhaps he just didn't know how to go about handling the relationship the right way. And for that reason... I feel very sorry for his father when he watches this, or when he watched this, because I'm sure he did. I guarantee you he did. And that's that's very sad that he, that he had to see this and realize, but it was too late. The prime example of people I hate in this world. You think you know how it all works. You don't know jack shit. You're lucky I didn't fucking blow your goddamn head off. Very easily could have. Could have walked right into your room when you're about to fall asleep and blow your goddamn head off and then went to the fucking store. Very easily could have done that. But I didn't. Because I wanted you to fucking suffer. When Randy says this, that he didn't kill his parents because he wanted them to suffer, I think another reason that he didn't kill them was because he loved them. You know, he clouds the hate 
he clouds the love with all this talk about how much he hates them. But internally, I believe he loved his parents. And that's why he longed for a relationship with them the way he did, because he fucking loved them. And uh, that's, that's so, so sad. That's why he didn't go in there and kill them on the way to the store, because he loved them more than anything. And the lack of relationship there is what pushed him over the edge. And suffer hard. So he wanted revenge on them. He wanted them to suffer, but he didn't want to kill them. You're a worthless fucking faggot. I mean, to say something, to say these types of things and to show this kind of expression towards a family member, you know, it's, it's because there's so many underlying issues and, and there is love within there. And that's why you're so upset. That's why you care so much. That's why you're saying these things, because you long to be understood and loved by that person who's very important in your life. And it's not just because of the job shit. All through high school, all through college, all through post-college. Fuck off. You can fuck off. Honestly, sometimes I don't know what mom saw on you. You're a worthless fucking faggot. Prime example of someone who could be nice and happy and easy going and joking one day to... Fucking, you better straighten out your fucking life the next. These criticisms. I, I could be bipolar too, but good fucking lord. Randy really took these criticisms to heart. Ooh, I hate father. my fucking profession. I want to quit. Find another fucking job. That's what you'd fucking tell me to do. Yeah, you hated your fucking job for years. What'd you do? You took it out on your fucking family. Way to go. That's definitely the answer to all your problems, isn't it? Yeah. You hear that? That's me fucking clapping and applauding from the fucking heavens above. Fuck you. This must have been the most difficult thing ever. I know. His, uh, we could have had it much worse. For his parents to watch. You could always say that. But it could have been so much better. Could have always been so much better. These long, intense stares that Randy Stare is doing, they, uh, they speak almost louder than any of the words that he could even say. You know, the thoughts and the emotions that his looks are conveying. It's just so powerful. You can feel, you can feel that confusion, that anger, that sorrow, all of these lower vibrational energies. You can feel them when Randy does his stare at the camera. When's the last time you ever said you were proud of me? When's the last time you ever said I love you? When's the last time you ever did anything for me? Never. Never. And honestly, I don't even fucking care. Because after care. high school, after college, after all that job shit, I was done with you. You do care, though. That's why you're... I didn't give a fucking shit anymore. That's why it's so important to you. I didn't. Yes, you did. So if I got word that, oh, you fucking wrecked your fucking front of your fucking truck by hitting a deer, I was happy about it. Oh, fucking brakes failed in your other truck. Cool. Saw your life flash before your eyes. Awesome.
I'll tell you one thing. Back in elementary school, middle school, I used to worry about dad dying the most out of anyone in this house. Because I loved him back then. And I cared about him. Once high school took off and college and all that, and I I found it impossible to love him anymore. You notice how much I ignored you ever since? You notice how many times you'd ask me to go out for breakfast or whatever and I'd decline? You notice how I never even said good morning. Hey, what's up? Mom's a little bit in that zone too. Like a good fucking year or so. I just didn't even like acknowledge anybody when I got home from work. But you know, it may be easy to kind of just talk about how crazy he is in this in this regard of his family it may be easy to blow it all off and just you know say he was a crazy murderer but um to anybody who's ever actually experienced these types of issues that he's talking about i think that what randy's saying now all of his thoughts it'll really hit them you know because if you've ever experienced these types of things within your own family then you know you know what it feels like and uh and you can't help but feel sympathy for Randy in that regard. You know, it's no excuse. There's no excuse to go about doing the horrible things that he did. But it starts to paint the picture and you start to see clearer what his home life was really like in that sense. Again, this is like first world problems, you know. We talk about first world problems. Um, just the fact is, no matter how good things can seem from the outside, there can always be serious internal conflict going on within the home that the outside just doesn't know about. Me and mom were like bread and butter. Could tell her anything. Could talk to her about anything. No matter how bad it would have been. Could always talk to her about that. With dad, I could not. And the craziest thing, like the craziest thing of all, was me and Jeremy became closer over the years. Like in elementary school, middle school, early high school, it's like I just I didn't want to deal with him at all. Cause he was always a douche to me. He was always a dick to me. The way it was, I was always the stupid, dumb kid, and he was always the smart one. He always knew what he was doing. He always thought I was an idiot, you know. And then once uh, college started and all that, we just became closer we started talking more and then we understood each other in a way although he had no idea like you had no idea like what i was like on the inside but you know we got it we got how the world like works and what mom and dad expected out of all of us and all that and we knew it wasn't fair and all this and we just we started to bond more and it was nice and i like that it's really great That was also when I started to hate your friends because they pissed me off. Started hating everybody. Tim fucking Kennedy. I wanted to fucking gut him from his fucking throat after he hit his after he hit my fucking car in the fucking driveway. Look under this fucking look under the steps. Where he wrote TK with a smiley face. I wrote TK is a fucking faggot for hitting my car. Go look right now. Pause this video and go look. You'll see it under the fucking steps. Right, where like Killer Kern's written and all that shit. Go look. I just, hey, he's lucky I didn't fucking do anything to him after that. I was this close to fucking kicking his ass. I would have. I wanted to beat the living fuck out of him. And mom made it out to be like, no big deal. He'll pay for it, he'll fix the car and all this. He still fucking wrecked my car. If someone hit your car, you wouldn't act all sympathetic like that. No, oh, accidents happen, all that shit. For one, it was meant to happen. And two, it's fucking bullshit. Fucking worst driver in fucking Pennsylvania right there. I'm at the top left of the driveway. He's at the bottom fucking right. How do you back into me like that? You're a fucking worthless faggot, you goddamn cunt. How do you pull that off? 
Randy's good at you're talking a fucking shit. Fucking worthless fucker. He's good at talking shit. I swear to goddess, you're goddamn worthless. Swear to goddess. Good fucking lord. So I couldn't believe I had to go through the whole process of fucking going through the claim shit again like I had, I had in the past with tolling my car and all that shit and going to get estimates and all this and when it wasn't even my fucking fault. That was one of the first times I started showing the anger inside of me when I got home after all that with mom. I just like, I'm like fucking sick of this shit and I was yelling and slamming my door shut and just wanted to fucking kill somebody. Randy, you know, if you're feeling like that and you're starting to feel that upset and angry with your home life, then it really is time to leave, you know, to go on and do your own thing. You know, we're not meant to stay in the nest forever. And once you become an adult, if you try to stay in that nest, well, it's probably not going to work out. That's when you need to go get out of there. Get away from that that you don't like, brother. I ain't kidding. Just threw the papers down on the table, and I started letting my anger show, and that's what's always been inside of me throughout high school, throughout college, and post-college, and it's, it's, it's who I am. I'm a girl, like, on her fucking period. <laughs> I hate everything. And I started talking with a girl online who was a fan of my videos and I was able to connect with her because she was like fucking crazy, like mentally crazy. I think she was a wrist cutter too, but I wasn't, you know, I never physically harmed myself. I never cut my wrists or anything like that. I hated hurting myself. I never did it. But this girl, her name was Rachel Hodge. She might have killed herself after this for all I know. But she was virtually on the edge of like literally like ending her life. She was suicidal and all this. And I was able to talk with her because she was able to connect with me and understood me and how I was feeling and all this stuff. And my hatred for the world, you know, we bonded together and bonded well. We knew the world was bullshit. We knew our lives were full of like fucking hell and we just didn't want to be on this planet anymore. And then the EGS stuff that I made. I want to say really quick, when he talks about how his world, his life is full of hell. It's, you know, all this worthless shit that he just hates. That's a filter that he's seeing it through. We all have the ability to see our life, to see our surroundings, to see our people that we interact with, to see our environment, to see everything through a filter. And that filter is up to us. We choose that filter. Some people are just the nicest, happiest people ever. And they're just, they have a very great inner world. They have a very great outer world. They're seeing everything through a positive filter. Randy and others like him see everything through a very negative filter. And in that aspect, they're creating their own hell. At the same time, we can create our own heaven. Many of us are kind of somewhere in between, not really understanding that we do have the ability to see everything a certain way. Connected with her more than like anything that had in her life up to that point. That was like one of the only things that was keeping her alive. So... I just grew a connection with her and I started talking to her about the shotgun I got. She was one of only two people I told about the shotgun and I could just talk to her about anything, which was nice because there was no one I could talk to about this stuff besides my own journal. So I started talking to her about all this stuff and you know, I said like, oh, I've had the gun in my mouth a few times, but never pulled the trigger. That's just because I was practicing, but I told her that stuff and she just went into deep thoughts all the time with me, every day, just telling me dark stuff, and I understood it, and I was desensitized to it all. It's because how I, that's how I lived, and always thinking about killing myself, knowing like no one seems to give a fucking shit about me, and knowing I have no future, and knowing I have nowhere else to go. And a, there were people who cared about him. B, he could have had a future. He chose not to have a future. Knowing that this is all I have, you know. And see, no, this was not all you had. You had potential to go on and do much better for yourself. But because you saw life through that very negative filter, you never gave yourself that chance, Randy. And we got that. She understood that. And knowing that I felt like a soul trapped on the inside 
begging to get out, you know. We connected well. And she made her own EGS character. Um, it's not on any of the posters or anything. It's not even on the channel. She just made her own. They call it an OC, which is an original character. That's what it's short for. But her and her friend got into it, and it was great. Because I, you know, I was expanding with fans and all that. And she made me a whole bunch of fan art. One she made of me last night, which is her in her Ghost Squad form saying, like, you know, one message. That's all it took to feel like a connection with somebody, and that was me. And I was the ghost on the other side of the picture, reading the message on my phone. It was beautiful. It was just great knowing I touched somebody in that way. You know, I kept somebody alive. And none of you know this stuff. I can't tell you this stuff. You know? And she wasn't the first girl to ever talk to me about suicide and all that. I had another fangirl at the time who I blocked out of my life afterwards, but she brought me down into the suicide shit and depression shit and started saying I threatened to kill her and all this and all this shit, but um, Rachel was just someone I could talk to about anything, so it was nice. And just being that she got it. It was amazing. There was another girl, Nellie Simmons, who helped contribute to the channel by, like, designing some of the Ghost Squad characters. I didn't design every single one of these from scratch. Um, only a few of them. But I added my own touch to the designs that she submitted to me and all this, but... Um, she was another girl I can talk to about stuff, but they were all, they were girls. They weren't guys. They were mostly all girls who I would talk to. The only people I would talk to in the last year on social media were girls. And, you know, I think that girls can tend to be more in touch with like their emotions, their inner emotions, that like female energy is more of an emotional energy. And perhaps that's why Randy could, uh, could interact with them the way he did. Males in our society today, we tend to not be too in touch with our emotions, you know? We tend to kind of block them out or not really acknowledge them. But girls, of course, uh, are very in tune with their emotions. They can be very emotional and they're not afraid to express it. So that's another reason why Randy was able to connect with the females the way he did. You girls. That's because I eventually started to realize I was sexist. I was sexist, I was racist, I was prejudiced, and I was discriminant. That is one hell of a fucking lethal combination. I've always hated black people. I fucking hate people who aren't white. Caucasian, whatever. I just... I hate the human race. And I just started hating guys more than anything. I hate guys. I think they're fucking disgusting. The facial hair they have. The body hair. The muscle build and all that fucking body structure shit. I hate all, like, everything about guys I hate. And the fact that I was forced to live as one, you know? That hurt a lot. It's just hate is not the answer. You know, if you're upset that you were born a male, that's okay. You can be upset about that. But to hate men because of that, you know? To take that out on other men, you say you hate their body hair you hate their structure it sounds like you're saying that these are all the things well, so first off it sounds like you ain't kitten but then it sounds like all these things that relate to yourself that you hate you say you shaved your body every day you hated your, your facial hair everything you hated it you hated the muscle that's why he didn't make any gains that's why he you know stopped eating he wanted to be fragile he wanted to look like a girl um not to say that all girls are fragile because some girls have more gains than you know most guys but um, he, he, these are all the things he hated about himself, and he took that out, hating it on others as well. Now, for the fact that he was so racist, um, I feel like there are probably some underlying causes for that. I don't think he was raised like that. I don't think he was brought up like that. He might have been, but I kind of doubt that. I think that's something he took on himself. You know, it's something we see with the type of people who do these types of things. We see it a lot within them is this hatred of, you know, the the other races, and uh, they feel that they're better than everybody. A lot of narcissism in there. And uh, I think Randy's a pretty good example of that, that type. And also being I hated my name, too. It's just, my life was a living hell. So for a year, I had Andrew on my fucking name tag for, war for work, which I never had to wear the name tag, because I'm on night shift. You don't need to wear your name tag, but... 
I've had Andrew printed on it the entire time. And mom asked me about it. I'm like, what? Like, she's like, what is that? Is that even your name tag? It was. That's when I started somewhat talking about the name, but it was just, I hated guys. I was never attracted to guys, which led to me realizing that I wasn't gay, which I, I guess you still probably had thoughts about that to this day. It's like, you know, cause I never had girlfriends or anything like that, but, um, I guess what it came down to was I felt like I was like transgender or something. Like I felt like a, a woman the whole time, which spiritually I'm a woman, I'm a female soul. But I had to live in a man's body to do what I set out to do. That was my soul contract. That was what I was meant to do. How did he actually start believing all of this EGS philosophy? You know, this EGS doctrine. How did he start believing this? You know, he's the one that came up with it. Does he feel that it came to him? For the, That must be it. He felt like it was given to him as the truth. And uh, it's just fascinating how he actually believed all of this EGS uh, shit. And I just For lack so of happy word. to know that I wasn't gay because you're only gay if you're attracted to guys, which I wasn't. So, well, congratulations. Very buddy. happy because I fucking hate gay people. Sounds like, you ain't like an exception would be like Freddie Mercury from Queen. I was like the only exception. So, he even says he hates gay people. So, he hates blacks. He hates anyone who's not white. He hates gays. He hates everybody. He hates everybody. I think he's just filled and fueled with hatred for everybody. But more than anything, for himself. But one of my fucking fanboys that I had, if you don't know what a fanboy is or a fangirl, they're people who are obsessed with your creations, your YouTube channels, whatever, your music, whatever. One of my fanboys was gay, and he actually came out to me. I never told anybody that, really. This guy watched me ever since 2009, and then last year he finally told me through Facebook that he was gay. And he just started. He was very, like, he was a very reserved and, like, well respected guy, but I fucking hated his guts. And I blocked him so many times over the years, but he kept coming back, and then I just let it go and all this. But he would still, like, open up to me about stuff, and he fucking, like, seemed like a psychiatrist to me. Like, he tried getting inside my head and all this shit, and it pissed me off. But overall, like in the end, he started coming out to me in a way which was like weird because no one's ever done that to me before. But the guy was like, you know, you said you hated gay people and all this. Like, I want to know why. Like, what's your deal with that? Like, not in like a, a shitty way or anything. Just like saying, like, how come? Like, why don't you like gay people? And then he's like, I guess you can try to. You get what I'm getting at here. I'm like you're gay, aren't you? And he's like, yes. Like, he didn't want to admit it, but he did. And I said, oh, well, you know, that's just how you are, and I respect that, and that's okay, or something. And he's like, oh, I'm crying. Like, I made the guy fucking cry. And it was like tears of fucking joy for him, and deep down, I'm like, I wish you would fucking kill yourself. But that's hateful as shit, Randy, to say something like that. That's hateful as shit, dude. needed help the guy watched me ever since 2009 for eight years this guy watched me that's and you for he watched you for eight years and you had the audacity to have that kind of a thought process in regards to him you wish that he would just quote kill himself ridiculous to think about so i changed his life in a way but, yeah, the guy fucking came out to me over fucking Facebook. It's like all this stuff that's happened to me you have no idea about. All the people's lives I've touched. All the people's lives I've changed. All the people I've helped inspire. All from my YouTube channel that you probably just saw as just like stupid childish videos or just a hobby or whatever. It was my fucking life. And then not being able to do that. Because of fucking full-time work and education and all this shit that didn't even matter to me. It devastated me. It crushed me. 
That's what I wanted to do because YouTube had the partnership program where you can make a bunch of money off of it if you got decent views, which wasn't reliable, which I knew, but that was my dream job was to make YouTube videos for a living because there's thousands of YouTubers that do that. But what made me happy about it was this year, YouTube made a whole bunch of changes to their monetization and stuff and people who were advertising started backing off from YouTube and people lost a shitload of money. So people aren't making really anything on YouTube now. So that was good that I didn't end up doing that. But, you know, I made money off of YouTube. I made a few thousand dollars off of YouTube, which is crazy. Just turning on a video camera and making sketches. But it was my life. It was all I wanted to do. It's how I was able to express myself. You watch the stuff I made, you'll realize that I'm venting to the world. I'm saying how I feel and that it's who I am. And I wasn't able to just do that in society. YouTube gave me a voice. And that was my way of expressing myself. And over time, I just became more comfortable with it. You know, it's just, I didn't care what people thought of me anymore. I would sit around the house with my legs crossed or, you know, I just, I just didn't care if I started seeming like more girly and all that. It's just, it didn't bother me. It's just like, so what? It's who I am. If you don't like it, fuck off. It's just what it was. So he knew he, what, he, what he wanted. He knew what he wanted. He wanted to be successful on YouTube. And if that's really what he wanted, he should have set that goal and kept going for it and continuing it. But he threw in the towel. He didn't have a clear enough definition of what he wanted to do, of how to get there. And he threw in the towel. When we know what we want, we need to realize that we do have the potential to get there to set the goal and to realize what it's going to take to accomplish that goal. That's what you needed to know, Randy. But it's just, all that was on my mind anymore were girls and girls and girls and girls. I could not get girls off my mind and the whole mm -hmm. cartoon channel is girls, dead girls. It's all girls. There's no guys. It's all girls. And in the squad, like myself, there are people who were guys on Earth that become girls in the Ghost Squad, which is where I'm going. But it's all girls. It just... See, he hates the male energy so much that all he wants is female energy. That's why he has his own a uh, cartoon that only includes females. That's all he wants is females. He's trying to overcompensate to get rid of this male energy and have nothing but female energy around him. And uh, it all stems from that internal conflict within him. There was never a girl on earth who was like, that. I'd love to screw her. I'd love to date her. I'd love to kiss her. Like I never had that. Never went on a date, you know. It's just, I never had that with the cartoons I did. And you can say, like, yeah, they're just flat, dimensional, paper-like images. What do you see in that? I see a whole other world. A place where you can be who you truly are. And a place where nobody can stop you from doing what you are. From doing what you're meant to do. This world is full of shit. It's all a big game. Life's just a game. And I fucking quit. Tough shit. There would be no possible way I could live until I was 60-something. Not a chance in hell. Honestly, I don't know how people do it. I don't know how people get up every day and go to like a fucking dead end job. Come home, do the same exact routine every fucking day, every fucking weekend. How do you honestly do that? I was never able to compute it in my head. How do you live on this planet for decades upon decades upon decades? Some of the things that Randy says seem kind of red pill, you know. He realizes that this society that there were all 
not all of us, but a lot of us are just robots that go about our day-to-day -day lives doing the same thing over and over, never hoping for anything more, but being content and just being, you know, sheep. And he could see that, but he didn't know how to, uh, he didn't know how to counter that. He didn't know how to change his own life to the point of where he's not that. And basically he failed. He really, truly failed at everything. But that, uh, that eye opening, that awakening that he had to the reality of our society, it really messed him up. And it's very unfortunate that he himself could not have been part of that society that he himself could not have remained a blue pill, that he himself could have remained a robot. Because people like him are not ready to discover the truth of our reality. I honestly don't know how you do it. I don't. I never understood that. I was just born without something, I guess. I don't know. It's just every night, I just feel more and more stressed, more and more bored, more and more like claustrophobic by being in this world. I just, I had to get out. I had to. I couldn't be here anymore. Couldn't stay here. It's like the weight of the world was just crushing me. I felt trapped. Like I couldn't be who I was and I had to be dead in order to do it. That's my destiny. I'm destined to be dead. Everyone alive is going to die someday, but I was destined to die from the beginning. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If someone truly feels like that, they don't want to be alive anymore at all. And they're determined to take their own life. And that's what's just the way it's going to be. There's, there's no help for them. And so be it. But to go out and take the lives of innocent people because you feel so upset, so trapped, that's where the true issue arises. You know, being forced to live, well, nothing can force you to live. If you're going to take your own life, then that's what you're going to do. Hopefully, none of you will. Okay, I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. But going out and taking other lives, that's what I have the true, true anger towards for people like this. I was destined to be a dead female ghost. And I was sent here to do something. And, I mean, the shooting thing, it shocked me when I started to get involved with it i honestly didn't think i was going to go through with it and then it just took over me it's inexplainable indescribable like because all my life i just i was terrified of guns in a way like i just i never thought i'd become this dark and then i just became desensitized to it all and it just sucked me in and then i just like a few times i stopped myself it's like wow I can't believe I just said that. Or, wow, I can't believe I just thought that. I can't believe I'm about to do this. And that I, I just feel like there's like a hand on the back of me just like pushing me forward to keep doing it. It's like there's EGS recruits telling me to do it in my head. Do it. Do it. It's not schizophrenia or anything like that. But it's like there's spirits telling me in my head, do it. If someone's pissing me off, do this, do that, you know, or it's okay. Don't worry about it. Fuck them. You know, it's like there was spirits telling me this stuff, how to act, where to go, how to respond, you know, it's just. All righty. That brings us to the end here. Uh, that might be the end. I mean, I don't think there's another part of this. If there is, we'll look at it. If not, then that, that wraps up our entire, uh, that wraps up our entire Randy Steer Goodbye Parents video. The thing that we learned from this, the main thing that I took away from this, 
is that his relation, lack of relationship with his father particularly um, had a tremendous, took a tremendous toll on Randy. And uh, it's no excuse, again, it's no excuse at all for what he did. But I think it definitely could have been part of uh, something that could have prevented, help to prevent this horrible tragedy from happening. I hope you enjoyed your time here. I know I sure did. I'll see you guys later. Thank you for tuning in. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Huge thank you to my supporters on Patreon. I really appreciate you, each and every one of you. Till next time, I'm Bay Shaman from BayShaman.com, the webcast king. And I ain't kidding. Humans.